translate what I said. Wakanege Makwa is my native name. William Buckholz is my Christian name, as they call it. Uh, my Indian name is Conquering Bear. And when we introduce ourselves, usually we say, Buju Anin, which is hello, hi. Conquering Bear is my name, so we say it in my language. And uh, I was been asked to read uh, the land acknowledgement. And uh, excuse me, I'm gonna hold this up and read. If my memory is not as good as it used to be, so. Uh, Chicago is part of the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ogawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi Nations. Many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Sac, and Fox, also called this area home. Located at the intersection of several great waterways, the land naturally became a site of travel and healing for many tribes. Today, Chicago is still a place that calls people from diverse backgrounds to live and gather. American Indians continue to live in the region and Chicago is home to the county's third largest urban American Indian community, which is still practicing its heritage and traditions, including care for the land and water. Uh, this quote from the American Indian Center of Chicago. Thank you. Good morning. Bonjour. I'm Lisa Kahn. I'm the co-chair of the Chicago chapter of French Heritage Society. And I'm so delighted that all of you are with us today, both in person as well as our virtual guests. Um, thank you for taking time out on a Sunday morning to join us. And uh, thank you very much, William, for your beautiful music and your lovely words. And it's really important for everybody to sort of take a moment and remember that the French were welcomed by Native peoples, the diverse multicultural peoples that lived in North America. And this is part of the French story. The French heritage is very much intermingled with the native peoples. Um, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit of uh, what French Heritage Society is all about. We have three main pillars uh, in our mission. Uh, one of course is l'amitié, which is the French word for friendship. Friendship between uh, the uh, France and the United States, of course, but also this general idea of acknowledging these different connections and ties that maybe we haven't um, been aware of, that we're hoping to uncover and realize that we have so many friendships. So this idea of l'amitié is a really important um, part of who, who we are. Uh, another is promoting uh, our educational um, internship program that we have uh, between French and American students. So we have uh, a well-supported program. We have students coming uh, to study, to work uh, here in the United States from France and vice versa. And uh, finally, um, through programs like this and our annual gala, uh, which will be in February, um, it's, it's through these kinds of programs that you're supporting um, that uh, the monies raised goes to our uh, grants and uh, helping to do restoration, not just in France, but certainly here in the Midwest. So uh, in November on the 15th, the um, completion of the restoration of the log cabin uh, schoolhouse in Bourbonnais, not too far from here where Charles lives, uh, we'll be meeting Charles soon. Um, that will be completed and it's uh, really exciting. So again, thanks to all of your support. Um, we have a lot of thank yous. So all that kind of support I want to acknowledge. Uh, first of all, our event sponsors to Sofitel Hotel and Resorts, uh, to Heritage Title Company, Brush Architects, Mary Brush, 
uh, and Schwinn May Del Sesto of Jameson Sotheby's uh, Real Estate. Uh, we're really grateful to all of you. Um, also like to acknowledge Mary Jo and Kevin Kelly uh, in honor of our own Kat Beaulieu and the Beaulieu family in memory of their dear mother, Elaine M. Beaulieu and her love of her French heritage. Uh, and also uh, a donation in honor of the Emile A. and Louise C. Moret de Vic family. Thank you so much. Um, a couple of little light housekeeping uh, I'd like to just mention. If you haven't already, please do uh, silence your cell phones. And um, if you need to take a little break for any reason, we encourage you to use the back door. Um, and the uh, restrooms are located close to the back door. You'll see signs for that. Uh, so thank you for, for um, keeping these doors shut. Um, also, for those of you joining us uh, via Zoom, if you, uh, during the Q&A portions of our, uh, our day together, if you'd like to ask a question, you can always do so in the chat and we'll be looking for those comments and questions. Um, so finally, what brings us here um, today? I know for myself, even though um, I, I tend to geek out and you know find uh, all these kinds of French things all over wherever I can, I've got to admit that um, some of these things are, are new to me, uh, new, new discoveries. So I'd imagine you guys are you know, kind of in the same boat um, that we get busy, we go through all of our day-to-day uh, -day, and almost like a piece of uh, you know, um, furniture, we, we, we use it, we sit on it, we relax, but we don't always take note of it. And this kind of idea of hidden in plain sight um, is really what um, motivated us to create this salon, which is our gathering, uh, a way for us to come together in an entertaining but informative way to um, learn a little bit about all of these pieces of furniture that makes our lives uh, meaningful. And hopefully it will become more meaningful for you uh, as you hear these, these uh, speakers share their, their expertise with you. Um, I hope that after today, you'll go back into our great city of Chicago with fresh eyes, fresh eyes to appreciate the history that came before so that we can put it back into the mix and, um, you know, think more deeply about how we encounter and think about our own city and all of these connections, all of these possibilities for l'amitié. Thank you so much. Merci. French names populate plaques, structures, streets, and statues in Chicago, and why? Do we just pass by without really looking? How much French heritage might be hidden in plain sight? Who discovered the area that is now Chicago? I'm going to say Columbus, because it usually is Columbus. No, nope. I know nothing about Chicago. The British or the French? I'm assuming it's the French. You the wrong person. No, it's okay. Do you have any idea? So when I say Jolia, what do you think of? Prison. Was he a mayor? He was an explorer. Flower. Paris, because I used to live there. Yeah. Uh, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> um, Romeo? Do you know an explorer? When I say Marquette, what do you think of? University. A Catholic church. Another explorer. Uh, was it Clark or Lewis? I want to say Hamilton, but I know that's wrong. <laughs> University. When I say LaSalle, what do you think of? University of Philadelphia. A car. I do not know. No. Architecture, usually. I don't know that one. I, that one I got no clue. Street? A street? Uh, probably not even there. In Chicago? I don't know. Honestly, no clue. A snail. Right now it's in France, so. So, do you know what bridge you're walking across right now? What it's called? <laughs> no, you don't. That's okay. I, You're standing on currently. This is Michigan Avenue. I do not know the name of the bridge I'm standing on. The, 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 the Michigan Bridge. The river something. River. No, I'm absolutely no idea. Walked over it yesterday. Yeah. Uh, it's the <laughs> Du Sable Bridge. 
know his name because I searched yesterday on Google. And do you know why it might be called the Dusable or I Dusable? I know a little bit. I know it's based on the... Sand. The who? Deuce. To be honest, I don't really know. The f f founder of... Um... Post here. Bonjour and welcome to the Hidden Plain Sight, a French salon about the French names that appear all over the map here in Chicago. Anyone here speak French? I'm guessing. Oui. Je, je m'appelle Christopher Lynch. I have the pleasure of being the MC for this program. And as we just saw in the video, if it wasn't for the Chicago River, there would be no modern metropolis on the site. The river literally put Chicago on the map. And as uh, Louis Joliet knew, if one could build a canal here, one could float a canoe from Quebec all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Or if one wanted to head west, once you left Chicago, you could take the Illinois River down to the Mississippi, go up north, get on the Missouri, go all the way to Montana. Chicago's location was the key, and the French, of course, knew it. I am a co-host of the Windy City Historians podcast, and as part of that endeavor, we have done quite a few programs on the French in Chicago. Why is there a Marquette Park? Why was the character from the Blues Brothers named Joliet Jake? <laughs> Why is there LaSalle Street? I'm sure a bunch of new signs, you've seen the new signs for, for Lakeshore Drive that celebrate John Baptiste Point de Sable. Qu'est ce que c'est? What's it all about? Well, that's why we're here today. That's the question that the French Heritage Society in Chicago wanted to answer. And thanks to everyone here, we're going to get that answer. And we have some heavy hitters in the world of academia and scholarship to shine the light on this topic. First, however, there is one ground rule, and I want to let people know about it. Um, FHS member Kathleen Boulou's husband, Jim. Where's Jim? There he is, Jim. <laughs> Jim has a very important job. He's in charge of the French flag. Which I call it. Now, I know on Bastille Day, everybody has a French flag, but today, only Jim has it. <laughs> and he's a timekeeper. So when that French flag is raised, now, we talked about this. When a little French flag is raised, that means the speakers have about two or three minutes left. When the big flag is unfurled, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> and we're, we'll end it mid-sentence mid if we have to, because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. So thank you, Jim, for, for doing that. Okay, so let's get on with it. Allons-y maintenant. The French Heritage Society is delighted to have with us this morning Charles Belisi. Dr. Belisi is Associate Professor of Early American History at the University of Illinois Champaign and is the founder of the Colonial American History Lecture Series at Newberry Library. He's the author of The Time of the French in the Hearts of North America, 1671 to 1818. And his book will be available for sale later uh, today. And he'll be joining us and setting the tone for the seminar because he's joining us via Zoom from Paris. City of Light. <laughs> so let's hope this works. Well, uh, good evening for Paris and good morning <clears throat> for Chicago. I'm very pleased to join all my friends and um, thanks to the technology for which I know absolutely nothing. Let me give you an overview. The French were late commerce to North America. They were late commerce because the French were not really interested in colonial expansion. There were reasons for that. While uh, you have, uh, uh, for the British, it was essential to export their surplus of population 
They will give them one way ticket and seven years guarantee work without pay. And they were crowding the ships. So <clears throat> by the time the French as a private initiative to begin with, soon taken over by the crown, landed on the banks of the St. Lawrence River. Basically, the whole eastern coast was in solid hands of the British. The French became interested in North America through the entrance on the St. Lawrence River when a delegation came from Canada led by the governor of Trois-Rivières, Boucher, Pierre Boucher, who was received by Louis XIV, the young king, who listened to him for three hours and turned him over to the minister of Colbert. All of a sudden, the Khan was interested for one reason, the possibility of the trees. Trees meant mast for the Navy. And as you may remember, uh, the French had huge trees, plantation, uh, but they were cutting and not replacing. All of a sudden, the mass were important. Be as it may, the development of the French establishment of the Saint Lawrence was very, very slow. The French crown eventually sent a governor and of course the Jesuits with whom the French crown of a sort of love-hate uh, relationship were right on their heels because the whole idea of converting the Native American. Therefore, the whole thing started with an exploration on the cheap. Louis Joliet was a businessman, so to speak. He was also graduated from the university in Quebec. So he was older, sort of, to join uh, Pierre, Pierre Marquette at uh, Mackinac Island. So together they pushed and eventually they reached all the way to the Mississippi River. This was the first attempt to push the French presence be besides the Great Lakes towards the Mississippi. The whole idea was to discover this famous passage, the Grand Passage, the waterway which would allow to go to the Pacific Ocean, because that was a concern, the idea, the hope to reach the riches of the, the Orient through an easy way, through that famous existing waterway. So eventually, Joliet and Marquette established some connection right away uh, with the Native Americans who received them in a very, very nice way. Because again, uh, the French were not there to actually take over the land. Is that a big, big difference with uh, English or Anglo-American exploration we'll talk about later. Eventually, a few years later, the most famous Robert Cavalier, who ennobled himself by calling him de la Salle, which was a piece of land, his family, extreme wealthy, from one old. So you have the very first exploration earnest, and um, La Salle, not to forget his deputy or assistant or number two, whatever you want to call him in terms of today, Henri Tonti, who was Italian born, Enrico Tonti, of course, which galicized his name as Henri Tonti. Together, together, again, on the cheap for the crown. The crown never spent a dime on exploration. The French monarchy took advantage of those exploration, um, offering them, of course, whatever they could eventually do as far as business, at the time, the pelt, the famous pelt, were essential in, uh, in, in business, and the crown, of course, would take a, a tax on this. But again, the French crown did not initiate, they allow La Salle to do his exploration. It took several attempts, 
And um, finally, after having opened different forts, Chicago was opened as a fort in 1683. Uh, and then you have the famous area called Star Rock, which is really Fort Saint Louis des Illinois. And of course, Peoria, which is the second Fort Saint Louis des Illinois. Anyway, without getting into the details, La Salle reached the Gulf of Mexico with about 100 men, including a large number of Native Americans who had joined the French troops, the French Marine. So La Salle, by reaching Mexico, the, new, the, the, Mex the, the Gulf of Mexico, officially in front of a notaire, an official law, claimed the whole of North America for the French monarchy. It's amazing. With the exception of the 12 colonies on the side, on the Atlantic coast, everything else was claimed officially for the King of France, all the way from Quebec to the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to the, uh, uh, to the, the West Coast, so to speak. And this was a legal, officially recognized action was a phenomenal gift to the French monarchy, which I don't think realized it, or to be brutally honest, did care. The, the strength is the ability of the French to take so much territory with so few people is rooted in one simple thing. The French did not come as conqueror of the land from the Native American, but as only sharing. There is a, a voyager song, they want a good pipe, they want a, a, a good smoke, but they don't want to establish big farms. In other words, they wanted to do some business because at the time they pelt, the beaver pelt was the rage because of the hats. Remember the three musketeers? All those guys had beaver pelts. So <clears throat> they exchange business, but not, no more land acquisition was necessary uh, eventually to cultivate enough subsistence. So furthermore, the French, I would say intermarried in a large sense without getting into uh, <clears throat> To offhand, so to speak, the French always looked for some good company, but at the difference uh, with many other people, they always recognized their children and was absolutely no different. With that, the Native Americans, starting from the Miami, the Potawatomi, the Illinois Confederation, the French would not have been able to survive the Native American were automatically French subjects with all rights as long as they became Catholic. And you know, it was a bit difficult for meeting Native American to understand the principles of the Catholic religion, but trust the Jesuits. They were able to do their best and to succeed. The Jesuits and the relations, which were in a mine of information even today. So <clears throat> eventually, um, with the event of Louis XV, and uh, who was still a child, the regent, the French explore and settle the lower part of their empire, what we call him today Louisiana, New Orleans, Natchez, Mobile, Alabama, a French created town, Biloxi, Mississippi. And this corresponds to a period in a French history when was uh, an idea to develop the riches of, the, of, North, of this part of North America. Therefore, you had for the first time a link from Quebec all the way to New Orleans. But that link depended on the mid, what we call today the Midwest, essentially Kaskaskia, Fort de Chartres, Saint Geneviève, Cahokia, these are the treasures they have left us to us culturally, historically, 
formed that link. The Midwest was a, the land bridge between Quebec and Louisiana because the two colonies were New France and Louisiana were governed separately but linked. The culture was a bit different. Uh, Louisiana um, adopted much of the West Indian culture. The Quebec people remained very Canadians, but eventually you will find in St. Genevieve, particularly a town which is beautiful as far and Prairie du Rocher just across, you'll find a lot of architecture which shows, uh, for instance, the Beckett Ribot house you see now on, uh, on the screen. So you had this development and you have this culture. Eventually, the, the, the problem which become of the French empire of North America became a problem of lack of population. Why the French did not rush to North America for a simple economic reason. Situation in France was good. The economy was good. The, the weather was good while the British island was awful. To make a little, just a little suggestion, just look at the French Revolution. The French Revolution, France had 20 million people, the biggest country in the world. The French Revolution raised 1 million men. Why? Because the population was not starving. And therefore, because the population was at ease in France, it was extremely difficult to convince them to go to North America. As a result, at the time, the famous French Indian War, that in France we call La Guerre de Sectan, the Seven Year War, which, by the way, I know it's going to hurt a few feelings, was started by Mr. George Washington. George Washington, uh, with a uh, um, did surprise the French troops and killed all of them all except one. And he started, literally started, the French Indian War, which was absolutely not in the mind of Hollande at the time. Be as it was, once it was started, you had maybe a grand total of 50,000 people. And here, by the way, is a location where it happened, um, the attack of uh, George Washington at the time. So you had on French Empire, from Quebec to New Orleans, a grand total of 50,000 people. On the other side, along the Atlantic coast, the 12 colonies had 1 million people. Do the math, do the numbers. It's very simple, 1 million people, you get a militia of about 80,000 people. 50,000, you get a militia of 10,000. Now you say the French could send troops. Ah, unfortunately, Britannia rules the sea, and this was a big problem. So the French were not able to reinforce their garrison in Quebec. Eventually, the war, as you know, <clears throat> ended up badly for the French. Uh, the plan of Abraham, the battle under the walls of Quebec, and the French did sign a treaty in 1753, turning over their colonial empire of North America to the British, with exception, on the western side of the Mississippi River, the real Louisiana, which went from today Minnesota all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, they turned over to the Spaniards. This was a family compact. The Spaniards were governed by the Bourbons and the French by the Bourbons. So <clears throat> the whole area changed hands and you had 10 years of British occupation on what we call today the Midwest. The, the French uh, bridge between Quebec and Louisiana. While of course Quebec was also under the British regime. The British extremely smart were not about to disrupt the Native American or the French for a simple reason. They spent a lot of money for that war and they hoped 
to get it back by reviving the fur trade. This came up with the Act of Quebec, protecting totally the religion, the culture, the expression. This is why later on, when the, the young United States revolts they go against the British, most of the Native American and many French remain on the British side because they knew that the Americans had promised to, to get rid of the Papists and so on. So you had this uh, combination and uh, you had this complicated situation. Now, everybody in the United States knows about Lafayette. I have a bad surprise for you about Lafayette and the area. When Lafayette came, to, he was sent by Washington to liberate, so to speak, Quebec. He didn't go very far. The people of Quebec, 13 years after the French monarchy abandoned them, knew that they were better off remaining British. And in fact, the hand-to-hand -hand combat in Quebec City, where the Americans were pushed back, was defended by a reg British regiment, which was totally French Quebec men. So these type of things are complicated. They often go against the, the myth, against the view. Like everything else in history, nothing is simple. Now, of course, it's easier to make it simple. Now, when the Americans arrive, <clears throat> eventually the, the fact the French population was so small, they were going to be overwhelmed by um, uh, English speakers. And this is when, of course, unfortunately, they start to push the Native Americans out of the way. And there's a magnificent uh, address by Big Turtle, a Miami chief, who said, our French father never took our land our English father never took our land. Why are you doing so? And this is dramatic because let's not forget, we talk about the Trail of Tears, you know, which but it was a Trail of Tears in Chicago in 1831. Very little is talked about. You know, people like Wilmette, you know about that suburb, Wilmette is really all you, I, Wilmette was a possession of a French family intermarried with Native Americans. So when the Native Americans were pushed out towards Kansas, the, will, the many, many French people left alone. Later on, eventually you have a very interesting event. I'm talking about Bourbonnet that Lisa Ken was talking about. You had French Canadians, who in 1838, 1840s, because the situation was so bad at the time under the British regime, did migrate to <clears throat> this area of Illinois. Eventually, what was left on this saga, if I may use them, that word uh, for the French in North America, what is left is an incredible wealthy culture leftover names and history that we are trying to maintain. And today it's uh, the America, it's, uh, the United States has inherited this. This is part of the United States. This is part of what we call in France the patrimoine. It belongs in a way to Quebec uh, because that's their descendants. It belongs in a way to France that they're descended, but it's East definitely belong to the United States. And all our pitch, our effort with Lisa and everybody else is to make people aware of the wealth of this culture, of this history, all the way to Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable, who um, had uh, married a Native American uh, woman, whose daughter um, only married and uh, went to, to Kansas, um, who would have been very surprised of, of the way the situation had evolved because the French are maybe at times very elitist, but I can assure you they are not racist in that sense. Um, without, you know, an example, 
when we saw um, that picture of of uh, the uh, the house in Saint um, many they were certainly slaves in black slaves, but many many were freed and eventually in is the French. So it's a whole complete story, which if you are interested, of course, is available to you. And uh, I, that's what I did in my book. Um, and I'm very happy that uh, still interests people. And my last word is, you know, go, go and see next door, not only the hidden sites in Chicago, and <laughs> the interview were amazing. Of course, you know, the world, La Salle, Marquette, Joliet, Point du Sable should be more and uh, become the people who go and educate it and go and travel. And that, je, je m'arrêterai, je pense que j'ai conservé la, j'ai respecté le temps des 20 minutes et je ne suis pas allé au-delà. Anyway, um, from Paris, uh, Bonjour, et, uh, je reste en contact naturellement. Merci bien. Doctor, can we get some questions from the audience for you? Uh, does anyone have a question? Don't be shy. Uh, doctor, the, the Jesuit relations, was that, was, oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, doctor, can you talk about the Jesuit relations and Huron documents uh, and how that helped historians like yourself uh, put together the story of, of France in uh, the Midwest? I hear you. Uh, in other words, you want to know what they were. The Jesuits needed financial support. Therefore, their, the missionaries would um, write extremely competent analysis of not only of the environment, but of the culture of the people they met. They are phenomenal studies and they were printed in France, a distributed all around. They were instrument of fundraising, but they are today a phenomenal resource as far as documents, not only document of history, but documenting precisely the culture and the way of life of Native Americans that came into contact. So they yeah. should be extremely careful not to antagonize and actually to respect completely the Native Americans. They were just many, many ways, as strange as it seems, how advanced that it was, engaged in a conversation on all the subject. Because let's keep in mind that a Native American religion is extremely involved, extremely complicated. And, um, and of course, is linked with, with nature. So those relations uh, which we have, and I, I used them a lot in my book, were are an extraordinary instrument today. Do people in France uh, study the French in North America? Is it something that scholars look at, like in school? The young, young people, do they learn about the French in Louisiana and whatnot? I, I did not quite understand your question. Is there something in the sound there which Chris is a question was for me? See, something always goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, my question was do people in France study the French in North America in their. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is very quick no. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately because again, you know. Uh, the, is amazing now. French, the French people are very aware of Quebec. You can make no mistake. A lot of Quebec artists, uh, writers are in France. And as you know, Quebec has a very special relationship with France. Quebec is, has been trying to become sovereign, independent. They, they are very different. 
But as far as the history of the development of the French in North America, no, very little is done uh, unless, uh, unless uh, they specialize. It's, um, although history is, is well, you know, well taught, and I would say probably much better than in the United States. We don't have social studies in France. We have history and geography. Okay, it's very clear. Nevertheless, the that this part is not uh, is not covered. I can assure you that. Yes, we have a question. Why did so many French and Quebecois move to Kankakee and Bourbonnais? The question is why did so many French in Quebec move to Kankakee, Bourbonnais? All right, because. Um, in the history of Quebec, was it was a revolt, and I'm going to Papineau. I'm not going to go into that. If you are interested, you can go on a computer on Google, and you can do it. But the the, the economic circumstances, on top of a, a political oppression at that time, made made advantage to go to an area which was. Already, they were French people. You have to remember on the Kangaku River, they were French people from the, from the Ancien Regime. So there was always a connection. On top of this, the Potawatomi were, who are in that area were very close to the French. So it uh, was a possibility. And uh, the church at, at first was not enthusiastic, but then decided to come along. And you have several hundreds of families who actually moved by boat all the way to Chicago and then on the trails uh, all the way to the Kankakee River. So you have today, I would say about 20,000 people who are French descent, with French names, Marcotte, Mina, name it. Uh, they don't speak French anymore. They did speak French all the way to the 1930s, but then a lot of factors came in and the language has been lost, but uh, we have a very dynamic a Bourbonnais of historical society, little commercial for my for my friend from Bourbonnais. Yes, we have another question. Uh, I would like to know how did La Salle die in the 18th century? What was the cause of that death? Yeah. The question is uh, what was the cause of La Salle's death in the, I think it was Texas. I didn't get that. Would you repeat it, please? How did uh, LaSalle die, or what was the cause? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to offend a whole bunch of people by the hand of his doctor, of course. <laughs> actually, actually LaSalle's last expedition ended up in, you know, in Texas. And there's a lot of, we, the, his three boats have been found, um, but he made uh, a huge mistakes. And um, as far as, uh, and the, his crew, the, his people revolted, except for a greater group. And chief among the, the, the people who revolted was uh, the surgeon. And he was shot and uh, was survived <coughs> uh, a, a little group, uh, including, um, uh, this, uh, including, I would say, perhaps eight or nine people made it all the way to Fort St. Louis de Zillinois, which is Starbuck. And they tried to keep the information secret. But it was a, it, it was a sad ending, or, you know, and he, he took many risks and, uh, and he made a huge mistake as far as, as, as um, navigation. And that's all happened. Uh, we have another question, two questions. Uh, sir, you, yes, go ahead. The question is one of semantics. Why is it not the Joliet Marquette expedition as opposed to the Marquette Joliet expedition? Well, because originally is Louis Joliet who financed the whole expedition, is told by the governor to go to the island of Mackinac to join with a missionary. The missionary comes along because, of course, the Khan wants to use the missionaries as a way 
to penetrate and by converting to, to Catholicism, the Native American, that will be a way to incorporate it within the French system of the monarchy at the time. So it's a Jordou Joliet expenses. And in exchange, he was going to get uh, the, the right to negotiate and to import pelts. This is why the Joliet market and not market Joliet. That's the difference. But by the time, by the way, they came to this area, there were already probably about 100 French people who were there. They came illegally because they were not authorized by the Khan. In those days, the Khan had to give you an authorization, a passport. And of course, the French being the French, since the Khan demanded money for that passport, they avoided asking the Khan and they came on their own. But the French were not unknown. And again, they came by themselves without a fear in the world with a Native American. And most of the time, of course, after living there two or three years, they founded families. So to say that the Juliette market was the first, yes and no, the first officially, but you know, was a climate and environment was already a friendly environment. There was another question back here. Uh, why did the French uh, sell the Louisiana territory uh, to the Americans? The question is, why did the uh, French give up the Louisiana uh, ter territory to the Americans? To, to, the, to Spain. Well, okay. Um, the was a way to compass. Spain had come to that war with the French and had lost Florida. So it was a way in a way to compensate uh, Spain and a way to make sure that territory would be kept safely outside the hands of the British. So as you know, this the French obliged Spain to retrocede uh, Louisiana to, the, to France. And as you know, Napoleon sold it to uh, the United States. Uh, later on in 1804. So it's, a, it's another complete story, which will take a, another half an hour to explain. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, we don't have a half hour. No, we don't. But doctor, we want to thank you. And later, we're going to have some wine and I'm going to toast you <laughs> with my wine. Well, I will have a good dinner tonight and I'll toast to, to okay. leave to the to to people there. Okay, so Dr. Belisi talked about Father Marquette, of course, and I must say Jacques Marquette was a presence in my life growing up. When I was young, I lived on the south side of Chicago across from Marquette Park. Our house was on Marquette Road. My parents had an account at Marquette Bank. <laughs> my wife, Cindy, would visit Marquette Park in Miller Beach, Gary, Indiana and several friends of mine attended Marquette University. So the Marquette name was Omnipresence. Our next speaker, Ruth Nelson, is perhaps the leading expert on the artwork about Father Jacques Marquette. And her book, Searching for Marquette, is an excellent guidebook to the Marquette art and statues that one can find in our region and beyond. I bought her book with me when I drove to New Orleans and I stopped by Helena, Arkansas, the furthest south that Marquette and Joliet made it before turning north. Ruth Nelson knows her subject, and of course, she has an eye for art, as Ruth teaches art history at the College of Page. I, for one, am delighted that Ruth Nelson is here today. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Chris. And I'm just uh, so happy to be here to this wonderful event. Uh, let me set up. Okay, here we go. Of course, Marquette and Joliet are best known for the Mississippi Expedition in 1673. Um, but what 
people aren't as familiar with is a year later, Marquette returned to Illinois. And that's the reason why there are so many more monuments to Marquette than Joliet. And in fact, the only monument I know of to Joliet in this area is in Joliet in front of the public library. <laughs> but, but first, a little background. Marquette was born in 1637 in the medieval town of Laon in north central France. He entered the Jesuit novitiate when he was 17 years old. And uh, as most of you know, the Jesuits are an order of the Roman Catholic Church founded by Ignatius Loyola in 1534. It, it was primarily a missionary order, but it was also dedicated to learning. And by the time they arrived in North America, they were already well established in China, Japan, India, and parts of South America. The Jesuits basically were the Navy SEALs of the Catholic Church. <laughs> I, the, the accounts, we talked about Jesuit relations, some are almost superhuman, uh, the strength and the endurance. But anyway, they had their detractors, but they were successful. And one of the reasons was to convert to Christianity, you did not have to become a white man first. So they had learned this from their experience. In 1666, when he was 29 years old, uh, Marquette was finally sent to uh, New France. In the first two years, he did nothing but study the Algonquin language. Because if you couldn't master the language, I mean, what was the point? You could not be sent out in the field. You would be held back. Uh, Joliet was seven years younger, born in 1645. He also received a Jesuit education. Um, and he was initially on the priesthood track, but that was not his calling. Uh, but nevertheless, he did very well. He, it's noted that he won a debating competition in Latin. <laughs> Let me just get used to this. Let's see, okay, there we go. Um, Marquette was in the mission field for five years when he was asked to uh, join the Mississippi expedition. But first, let me move. Yeah, we can still see this. Um, let's see the other way. He was first sent to Sault Ste. Marie, then over to La Pointe, uh, what is La Pointe, Wisconsin today, and then uh, Mackinac Island, but ultimately St. Ignace. Uh, and this is where Joliet came to, to meet him and they headed out. So I'm not going to focus on the expedition itself. Um, I'm going to talk about Marquette's return trip. But once the expedition was over, Joliet continued back to Quebec and Marquette went to the mission at Green Bay. There was a Jesuit mission uh, in Green Bay headed by Alouet, Father Alouet. And um, that is today known as the town of De Pere. And it was a plural name, so it was meant of the fathers. So uh, October, end of October 1674, Marquette departs the Green Bay area. Uh, to start his journey to Chicago. And that's very late in the season to uh, start an expedition. And the only reason I can think of is he had made this promise 
to the Illinois, he wasn't well, and he felt time was not on his side. And so he portaged, he went up Green Bay, portaged through Sturgeon Bay for all of you Door County lovers, and then came down. He arrives at the mouth of the Chicago River on December 4th, 1674. And he was accompanied by two Jesuit lay volunteers. And they were very important because Jesuits were not allowed to carry guns. And uh, hunting was critical for finding food in the winter. So they stayed at the mouth of the Chicago River for, four, uh, for eight days. And this is why at the turn of the last century, Marquette was considered the founder of Chicago. So this is another reason why we see so much dedicated to Marquette. Okay, so let, let's fast forward 200 years. And uh, Chicago held its uh, 1893, uh, World Columbian Exposition, marking the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus. And it was meant to be in a celebration of the new world. And one of the directors was uh, Owen Aldiss. He was a real estate developer, responsible for, uh, you know, at the time he was responsible for about 20% of the uh, office space in downtown Chicago. Remember, this is only like 20 years after the fire, not that long. And let's get a picture of him. Oopsie, what happened? No. Which one? It's behind this. Oh, maybe. What is this? Well, while we're working that out. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, oh, there we go. And I just want to move to the next slide. I pressed. There we go. Thank you. So the famed architect, or architect Louis Sullivan remarked that there were two people responsible for the modern office building. The first was William E. Hale, the inventor of the high-speed hydraulic elevator. The second, Owen Aldiss. Now, Owen Aldiss had a deep affection for Marquette. And as a hobby, he translated Marquette's journal. And he decided my next building is going to be dedicated to Marquette. And that brings us to 140 South Dearborn, the Marquette building. And he was very intentional about his artists. He hired artists from the fair to decorate the building. So uh, basically the Marquette building is is an extension of the exposition. Uh, one of the artists was Herman Atkins McNeil, who did the bas reliefs on the exterior of the building, depicting scenes from Marquette's journal. I suspect it was Owen Aldous who selected the scenes that would be depicted. but it's the interior that's so remarkable. Um, Owen Aldis uh, hired the best that money could buy. And that was uh, Tiffany uh, to complete the uh, rotunda mosaic, 60 feet. Uh, it, the, the head mosaicist was Jacob Holzer. He was the, the number one mosaicist for Louis Sullivan and uh, Tiffany also exhibited at the exhibition, uh, but and and it includes panels that tell additional stories or episodes from Marquette's journal. 
<laughs> you see here also uh, portrait busts that uh, portray the major actors in the French Indian theater. And all but two were done by Edward Kemys, who was an exhibitor at the fair and also sculpted the lions in front of the Art Institute. Uh, the two uh, that he didn't do, Marquette and Joliet, were done by Amy Bradley, one of the few female exhibitors at the fair, who was also the sister to Aldous. Oh, I wanted to point out one, one thing. Let me go back for a second. Uh, in the 1950s, there was a renovation where they put in the new elevator doors and uh, the green marble. But if you look, Right up here, you're going to see um, a remaining banker's cage from 1893. Um, there were other uh, banker cage grills that were raffled off at a fundraiser in the 70s. So th they're gone. They're all gone. Um, okay, we saw this. And then we're going to look at some of the mosaics. And here's a medallion of Marquette. On the left, we have emblems of the Native Americans on the right of the church. And if you look at the background, it's square mosaic pieces in blue waves representing Lake Michigan. And then there is a medallion of Joliet. But something about this just didn't sit right with me because to me, it didn't look like a 17th century voyageur, but it looks a lot like Buffalo Bill. <laughs> so it's very likely Holzer was inspired by what was going on in Chicago at the time. Uh, this is now a scene uh, called uh, the first meeting with the Illinois. Now, I'm, I'm going to go over a few things about this. First of all, and this is a minor point, I would have reversed Marquette and Joliet because the calumet or the peace pipe was given to him. Um, another point was he dressed the Indians in the garb of the Plains Indians and not those of the Great Lakes region. And then there were uh, mosaicists in Chicago. Mosaic was a big deal because uh, walls that were uh, lined in mosaic were easy to clean with all of the coal in the soot dust going around. But anyway, so uh, Holzer was criticized because he departed from traditional mosaic, the small cubes, and used very large pieces of glass. And that was like mosaic heresy. So, but I think it was very effective. The one thing he really did get right is they are all meeting as equals, the Indians and the French. And actually, each one had something the other wanted. Okay, the Jesuits, they wanted souls. The French, the furs the Indians, the trade goods, which would advance them technologically 5,000 years in one afternoon. Now, uh, Marquette talks about this event and he records dialogue in his journal. I'll read this, the Sachem or the chief, rose and spoke thus. I thank thee, Blackbound, for taking so much pains to visit us. Never has the earth been so beautiful, nor the sun so bright as today. Never has our river been so calm, nor so free from rocks, which your canoes have removed as they passed. Never has our tobacco had so fine a flavor, nor our cornfields looked so beautiful as we behold them today. So it was a very warm welcome. Marquette notes that when he met the Illinois, he saw that they were wearing cloth, which would indicate that they had already contact with the French. 
Now, uh, Longfellow uh, picked up this text in more from Marquette's journal for his epic poem, Song of Hiawatha, written in 1855. And at, towards the end, he includes a meeting between Hiawatha and a black robe, which would be a Jesuit. This is what he writes. Never bloom the earth so gaily, never shone the sun so brightly as today they shine and blossom when you see us, when you come so far to see us. Never was our lake so tranquil, nor so free from rocks or sandbars. For your birch canoe in passing has removed both rock and sandbar. Never before had our tobacco such a sweet and pleasant flavor. Never the broad leaves of our cornfields were so beautiful to look on. So you see, and, and even his nemesis, Edgar Allan Poe, criticized him as a plagiarist. But, but you know, if Marquette was here, at that time, he said, well, let him have it, you know. It wasn't that big of, it would not have been that big of a deal. Uh, and I do believe that this, this is one of the reasons that there was a sort of Marquette mania. It, it fueled that interest in Marquette. So, Moving up Michigan Avenue, we come to the 333 North Michigan Avenue building built in 1928. And right along here is a mezzanine level where the sculptor Fred Torrey tells the story of Chicago and he starts out with an Art Deco Marquette. Uh, Torrey was a student of Laredo Taft. Then moving onto the DuSabo Bridge, we have this plaque to uh, Joliet and Marquette. And I used to work at 400 North Michigan Avenue and I pass this every day from the train station going and coming for years. I never saw it. Mm -hmm. I never saw it. So talk about a hidden in plain sight. And just on the other side of the bridge is a plaque to LaSalle. Oopsie, wrong direction. And then we come to the northeast, uh, the bridge house on the, the northeast corner of Michigan Avenue and the Chicago River. And this is the Discoverers done by John Earl Fraser. And we see here Marquette that was dressed in Franciscan robes. And he even added a tonsure to the head, so a shaved head. And this to me looks more like, let's say, oopsie. Oh my, oh my goodness. I, my apologies. I'm sorry, yeah, a preview, okay. I, I'm not gonna use this pointer cause I'm, I'm getting, but anyway, to me, that looks more like LaSalle and Joliet. And just a word about the, the Indian. We see the Indian naked sometimes in Jesuit relations. That is how they met the Indian. It's recorded. But I have another theory that American sculptors, when they went to Rome at the turn of the last century, they were surrounded by beautiful Roman, ancient Roman sculpture. And they were like, wow, we don't have that heritage. But wait, yes, we do. So they began to see the Native American as an equivalent to the uh, Ro ancient Roman sculpture, which was the human body perfected. So this is, to, in addition, uh, James Earl Fraser uh, was responsible. He designed the Indian head nickel. And we see that profile recycled mm -hmm. in this monument. And then uh, going up to 632 North Dearborn, the old Chicago Historical Society building uh, has over its entrance this bas relief of Marquette, Joliet, and an Indian guide. And here, who, the unknown sculptor depicts Joliet more as a 49er. Mm -hmm. 
panning for gold. But uh, this building then later became the Excalibur nightclub. Also, okay, so I had mentioned Marquette and his traveling companion spent eight days at the mouth of the Chicago River. They started their portage, but due to the cold weather and Marquette's poor health, they uh, decided to camp around what is believed to be 26 in Damon Avenue. And so uh, the Chicago Historical Society decided to mark that spot with a cross. And for the dedication ceremony, anyone who was anyone was here, including the French consul. And we see over here the French flag. And this became a pilgrimage site. Uh, by 1930, uh, the city of Chicago decided to uh, uh, commission a monument uh, also dedicated to Marquette at the uh, 26 uh, Damon Avenue Bridge. Uh, and that's around, that's not that far from 26 in Damon. <laughs> and this was designed by Thomas O'Shaughnessy, who uh, also designed the stained glass windows at Old St. Patrick's <laughs> Church in Chicago. And I just want to point out, people always ask me, well, what about the swastikas? But uh, first of all, James was the anglicized word for Jacques in this uh uh, on this plaque, but the swastika had been uh, a Native Amer ancient Native American motif. Oh, by the way, uh, Damon Avenue was named after Father Arnold Damon, founder of Ignatius High School College and then later Loyola University. And then going further southwest at 48th and um, let me just check Archie, Harlem. Yes, 48th and Harlem. Oh, I'm getting the flag. Okay, let's move along. Uh, uh, the Chicago Portage, the Waterway West, Waterway West, and this is the Chicago National Historic Site maintained by the Friends of the Portage, a wonderful group. And then uh, the French never celebrated Marquette the way Americans did, but for the 300th anniversary of Marquette's birthday, uh, the town of Laon, Marquette's birthplace, uh, dedicated this monument. And at the dedication ceremony uh, was in attendance, Joseph Schlarman, who was the Bishop of the Diocese of Peoria, and he had one, the same, a replica a cast. And if you go to Utica off Main Street, you will see this monument by St. Mary's Church. So Marquette arrived in, in the Starved Rock area, April of 1675. It was Holy Week. He spent four days. Uh, but he, he had to get back to St. Ignace. He was not well. So they were advised, we'll return the south end, uh, the south shore of Lake Michigan on your way back up. And so we know he was down the, the southern tip of Lake Michigan. And in uh, the early 1900s, a French relic, silver relic, a lavorium, uh, which would be like a portable baptismal font, uh, was found on a farm. And because of this, uh, the, uh, the head of U.S. Steel commissioned this statue for it's in Miller Beach, which is actually part of Gary now at the Marquette Beach Park. And it was done by Henry Herring, who also did all of the architectural sculpture for the Field Museum. And if you go to Union Station, you will see two large statues of night and day in the main waiting room uh, of Union Station. And those were also done by Henry Hearing. <laughs> so 
once they got to the river, today known as Pierre Marquette River in Ludington, Marquette knew he was dying. So asked that they stop. He, was, he died, was buried here. His last words were, mark my grave with a cross, which he did, which they did. It's depicted in the mosaic. And here on the exterior is a bas relief of uh, the ceremony that, that uh, those converts up at St. Ignace came and retrieved his bones. They were reinterred under the floor of the chapel. De profundis are the, the first two words of the funeral mass in Latin. So uh, now we'll fast forward to 1973, the Marquette building was going to be demolished. Mm -hmm. And so there was a New York developer who came out and bought every single building, including the Marquette building. He was going to demolish, build new office buildings, but there was one holdout on the block. They refused to sell, and that was Italian Village. <laughs> and that bought time. So um, here we have, six, uh, 1973 was also the year of the reenactment of the Mississippi Expedition, headed by Lewis, uh, Reed Lewis in the far left corner, and they joined in on saving uh, the Marquette Building, and this was the start, really, of the Chicago Landmarks Preservation Movement. And I, I'm dating myself, but I remember yeah. Reed Lewis visited my high school <laughs> to make a presentation on Marquette and Joliet. So after this, um, after the tricentennial, the story sort of faded, started to fade away. So that's why I'm especially grateful that uh, the French Heritage Society decided to host this event. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So Ruth, um, we'll do some questions. Oh. First of all, would you mess with these guys if you were a developer? <laughs> I'd say, they know. Oh, here you, you can use the microphone. I'll stand over here. So, I have a question um, about the, the what's the word? The, the gravitational pull of Marquette. When you go up to like Mackinac Island and whatnot, it's, you're, you're in that, you're in the zone. You go to uh, Madeline Island, you're in the Marquette zone, right? Chicago, obviously. When does it start to, last, to loosen? Maybe St. Louis, around oh, there? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, Saint, and that's a really very good question. Uh, St. Louis holds the altar stone uh, that Marquette. Uh, it's, it's considered a relic of Marquette. Uh, I'm sorry. I think it's on. Yeah. Yeah. But part of the reason is uh, Marquette does not talk about St. Louis. And even in Wisconsin, like Racine, Racine does not talk about Kiwani uh, does, but not Racine, because there is no tradition of Marquette being there. So maybe Marquette and Joliet both stopped at Saint, the St. Saint Louis region, but it's never highlighted in the journal. So it does fade once you get, get further south. There's a great picture in your book of, was it at the um, World's Fair in St. Louis of Marquette? Oh, yes. And it was, I don't think it was ever made, it was maybe a plaster, right. but it's an incredible uh, photograph of uh, like a Marquette leading to God or something? Yeah, it is. Uh, Marquette was included in, in the fair, uh, but that was never commissioned in bronze. But it is a beautiful statue. I believe it was Cyrus Stalin who did mm -hmm. yeah, a number of also American Indian sculptures. So the man that built the Marquette building, yeah. um, was he Catholic? 
uh, I, I wondered that, and by all accounts, what I could find, he was Episcopalian. But that brings up a good point because uh, at that time, the figure of Marquette bridged Protestant and uh, Catholics. He was more religion and secular. He was like a civic hero mm. and even a bridge Native American and European. Yeah, I wonder that because guys like Burnham, they were all good Presbyterians. Oh. And they all went to the, the chapel over here on, uh, I think it's on LaSalle Street. Oh, yeah. Or Michigan Avenue, I forget where it is. But I mean, this is where the money people were. And I, I couldn't figure out how they were devoted to this black robe. Yeah. I couldn't quite, because if you were Catholic in 19th century Chicago, that, that was an impediment. Yes. And, and really, I think also... Marquette, the time of the Columbian Exposition, uh, I read some articles from New York Times, mm. and they just, they were so condescending towards Chicago. Mm. So Marquette became uh, sort of, well, you know what? Our Marquette could be your Pilgrim Fathers any day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Well, I'm from Joliet, Illinois. And, uh, it kind of goes after your question too, Christopher. I always assume that Marquette and Joliet was part and parcel of teaching history across the United States. When you talk to people on the coast, they have this physical look like who are who are those? So not just St. Louis, but what's your experience about maybe the zone? Is it strictly Midwest? When you get further out, do they know what we're talking well, about? Well, actually, yes. Uh, in 1877, when uh, the priest at St. Ignace discovered what he believed was the ruin of the ruins of the Jewish, uh, Jes Jewish Jesuit uh, chapel, he found the bones. It made it to the New York Times. Oh. It made it to the New York Times. So at one time, Marquette was right up there with George Washington and Columbus. Um, but that faded, and I, my sisters out in New York, they don't know Marquette. Yeah, you know, I said, well, have you heard of Marquette University? Oh, yeah. Okay, so then they can make the connection. Trivia question. Uh, in the statutory hall in, in Congress, every state is allowed two statues. Who's from Wisconsin? Marquette. <laughs> And there was, that is another interesting chapter. At that time, there was a growing anti-Catholicism movement across the Midwest, and there was a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> opposition to having a priest uh, representing the state. However, he was not the first clergyman mm. to be represented. Uh, so... Uh, there was not a big dedication, but that did go through. And um, what's what's the other one? Do you know? Uh, I think it's Roger is it Williams, the founder of Rhode Island. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, what of all the statues you've looked at? What's the one that is very compelling to you? The one in Gary. Yeah, I've been the to one that by one by Henry Hearing. It, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's very beautiful. A lot of people have wedding receptions at the pavilion there in Miller Beach, which yes. is beautiful. Yes, it, it's lovely. It's just beautiful. Oh. And it's not that far from Chicago, from downtown Chicago, and they have great beaches. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And nobody knows about it. <laughs> More questions? Yes. How old was Marquette when he died? Oh, that's a good question. He was 37. Oh. Wow. wow. And they believe that because he was lucid until the time of death, that he must have had uh, either a dysentery or a, oh, I forgot to read. Uh, uh, he had a bloody flux. He writes about it in his journal. He had a uh, bloody flux. So uh, could have been a typhoid also. Yes. You've been able to present testimony about Marquette to the current commission that's looking at. I've written, mm -hmm. I've written to them, I've written to the newspapers. Uh, I haven't gotten any acknowledgement. 
Uh, so I don't know what is happening, but I think that if people knew the history, they would be more uh, open to Marquette's, uh, the Marquette monuments here. Like uh, Dr. Balesi was saying, they came in friendship. You were talking about Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, I think you're quite right about that because I was up in Green Bay recently and I saw Nicolette Bank and statues of Nicolette, Jean Nicolette, mm -hmm. all over the place. No Marquettes, just, yes. just Nicolette. Now, there was a plaque in De Pere, a very large plaque. I went to see it, but uh, by one of the river locations along the water, but with renovations, <laughs> mm -hmm. and as the story fades, the plaques are removed. Uh, this was more because of redevelopment. It's it's held at the historical society, but again, it's it's all fading mm -hmm. uh, because he was in the Green Bay area. But again, that they it's more Nicolet country. Yeah. Yeah. Are you saying that after three hundred years, people forget? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think Nicolette was there in what, uh, 1634 or something. Right. So even Four. farther back. Yeah. Right. Yes. Any other more questions? Yes, sir. Was there a particular reason for Marquette's trip to Starved Rock? Well, uh, the Illinois had asked him to return. And so they were going, he knew what he wanted to do was visit the Illinois when they were having their large council meeting so he can talk to as many as he possibly could and they were holding their council in the starved rock region oh just a couple more minutes i'm sorry a couple more minutes any other questions ruth you and i were talking earlier um tell us about your new project oh my new project is uh the shipping of the Pieta to the New York World's Fair. And that'll be coming out by, uh, be published by Cornell University Press. Did you just call FedEx for something like that? <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot more complicated yeah. than that. And there was a lot of opposition to that too. Does the, does the Pope have to sign off on the manifest? He did. Well, he did. He have did? To, well, he did have to give his approval wow. because it belonged to the Vatican. Yeah, but it was a thank you for all of the uh, work that the Americans did to rehouse refugees from Europe oh. and all of the support. And so this was when uh, John the 23rd was still alive. So Vatican II. It was, it was, it was, yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, was this before or after it was attacked? What were the before. Hammer? Before, okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, it survived a trip to New York and back, uh, but then was attacked in Rome. Oh my God! And for those who have been in, in St. Peter's Basilica, it's in the back. I don't know why it's in the back. It should be in the front. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember seeing it. I'm like, that looks like the Pieta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, yes. You got a minute? You do you not have a book? On oh. the subject, and why don't you take 30 seconds to flog that? So, <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. Um, what I did, uh, I wanted to uh, tell the story of Marquette through the artwork uh, around the Great Lakes. And so I took my own little, you know, pilgrimage journey uh, to uh, around the Great Lakes. And I recorded the photos, and every chapter is in my book, Searching for Marquette, is where there is a monument, and everywhere there is a monument, Marquette had been. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have those available as well. I, I have a sequel for you. Okay. How about George Washington slept here? <laughs> I think some of mine have done that already. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Ruth. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, we've been here about an hour, so if anybody wants to stand up and stretch your legs, go ahead and do that.
This is the seventh inning stretch, like in baseball. Well, I love the book. I, I devoured it. I, what was interesting to me about the plot, about the Protestant stuff was how you know, I learned from your book how they had a mass in Helena, Arkansas, and they dedicated and they broadcast it on the radio, and all these good Baptists were tuning in. And I mean, I thought that was remarkable for 1930 something, the South. Yeah. Um, yeah, because the Catholic Church in Helena had been burned to the ground. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so that was rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So where Kenneth builds this really, this really interesting position. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to mess up on the scene. Oh, my God. <laughs> What's that? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Clint Eastwood. Yeah, exactly. I am last. Yeah, I turned twelve. Okay, folks. If everyone could take their seats, we'll continue. All right. Well, we didn't really rehearse them like this, so. so. I don't know what to say. Okay, folks. And now continuing our journey through French Chicago, if Father Marquette was in this region as a Jesuit to save souls, our next explorer was here to make money. His name was René Robert Calvier Sur de La Salle. And it is fitting that La Salle has a street name for him in Chicago's financial district. I think he would have approved. Now, I first saw our next speaker, Lorraine Boissonneau, interviewed on WTTW's Channel 11 about her book, The Last Voyageurs. Lorraine's book went into great detail about a famous 1976 reenactment of LaSalle's exploration of Chicago and the Mississippi region. This exploration had been dreamed up by an Elgin French teacher named Reed Lewis. And the canoes used on the voyage were made by the legendary canoe enthusiast, Ralph Fries. As I watched the interview, my memory banks began to fire because when I was in elementary school, like Ruth, Reed Lewis came to my school, <laughs> dressed as LaSalle with the hat, he looked like a Three Musketeers. And he gave a presentation on this epic trip that Lorraine has written about. So I ran out and bought Lorraine's book and I read it at the speed that a hungry man eats his dinner. <laughs> it was fantastic. I later had the good fortune to interview Lorraine for an episode of the Windy City Historians podcast. Lorraine is a contributing uh, contributor to Smithsonian Magazine and we were talking briefly before and she, she's been in the New Yorker, which is pretty impressive. And she has a unique ability to make history come to life. So I'm delighted to introduce Lorraine Boissonneau. Lorraine. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
add to the conversation about where is French history taught. I'm originally from Northern Ohio and I didn't know any of this growing <laughs> up. I didn't learn any of it. I didn't find out despite my family background being French Canadian. I didn't learn at all about any of these voyagers, any of the Marquette or Joliet expeditions. Um, I didn't actually start getting involved, interested in it until I was in college and it was my own interest looking for that information, trying to find out more about it because I wanted to understand a little bit more why there were so many French names and sites and schools and everything like that. Um, I'm sorry. I no, it's okay. The whole thing. I know where it is. I just, the whole screen disappeared. I'll find it. I'll find it. Just let me focus. Okay. Masal. This one, yes. Okay. <laughs> but I have to make it. Big uh, uh, screen. I think I have. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm confused now, but this is not the way we pull it off. Yeah, that's what I yeah. was thinking. It was somewhere. Yeah, but... I think it was on there before. We had prepared it. I know it's like, okay, this is better. Mm -hmm. Well, but okay. I have to share first. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's, really... it's okay. I'm going to get there. What is this one? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, got there eventually. So, um, anyways, as I was saying, because I didn't have that background growing up, one of the other ways I got interested in La Salle and Voyagers was actually because I grew up sailing on the Great Lakes. So before we get started talking about who exactly LaSalle was. Okay, now it's not going forward. <laughs> oh, oh, I will oh just gosh. use those hours. There. Just, yeah. All right. So as I was saying, I wanted to talk about the Great Lakes first and um, specifically Lake Michigan, since that's where we are. And so the Great Lakes have been around for more than 10,000 years. They started forming about 20,000 years ago when the most recent ice age ended and the glaciers started moving back north and scraping out huge gouges in the landscape and being filled with water. And today they account for 21% of the entire world's fresh water. They're also about the size of the entire United Kingdom in terms of surface area, not depth, if you put that together. So I think it's very easy for us to take that for granted. What is right here? I would argue that in addition to the French in North America being hidden in plain sight, so are the Great Lakes. They often get overlooked as just flyover country, but even here we think of them more as a pretty landscape rather than something that was really, really important as a thoroughfare. So if you're imagining, you know, Chicago 300 years ago, long before the city, before any thoroughfares, before Lakeshore Drive, what you're looking at is really a way of transportation that had been used for thousands of years by the native people who lived in the area. And that could be, you know, forests on the shore, wetlands, marshlands, beaches like we see today. And of course, they were traveling in canoes. And that meant, you know, that weather, severe weather like water spouts, storms were a really significant threat. And when LaSalle arrived, that would have been a big threat for him as well, something that he would need to understand by relying on those relationships with the different native people. And the same goes for, you know, the weather. It was so cold and in a number of places in the Jesuit relations, they talk about how frigid it is in this area. And of course, there's winter in France and Europe as well. But this is really something different, especially if you are just unfamiliar with the landscape. So 
that's what LaSalle was coming into when he first came into North America. That was kind of the environmental context that he was suddenly dealing with. But who was he? We see his statues around the city. We see his name, obviously, just not far from here. So I can't go over all the minute details of LaSalle's life because he was busy. So <laughs> I'll give a, a basic biographical sketch. And this is some of the key dates. Um, one is 1677. That should be 1673 to 1677. But so um, to talk about his early life, he was born in Rouen, France in 1643 to a relatively affluent merchant family. And his older brother took orders with the Solchichen order pretty early on. So LaSalle was destined to kind of inherit the family land, but then he went and started studying with the Jesuits and ended up giving up his inheritance more or less. So LaSalle wanted to travel even when he was with the Jesuits. He asked to be posted to China and other places and was turned down and decided to leave the order because it sounded like he wanted to see more of the world. But at that point, having no inheritance anymore, he needed a way to earn a living, make money, and that was part of what drew him to New France, the colony that had been established there. So when he arrived in 1666, he was given charge of a seigneury, which was basically like a feudal manor um, that he would be overseeing and having renters who would farm the land and he would have relationships with whatever native people were in the area as well. And at the same time, kind of as we talked about with the other explorers, um, learning the languages was very important. Um, so he started learning Iroquois and other languages right away. And at one point, he even recorded a Seneca creation story that scholars found recently and translated it to show the continuity of oral storytelling among the Haudenosaunee. So his work continues to influence the way that we think about and understand um, a lot of different aspects of history today. And the political situation in New France was kind of complicated because it was being overseen from France by the Minister of Finance, uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. And then in the territory itself, there was a royal governor, an intendant, and a bishop. And they were overseeing the colonists. And um, not that there were that many in number, but because of the fur trade, there were businesses that were operating here that had to be regulated and have the shipping and everything like that. So the other thing to keep in mind is, um, they weren't obviously the only political players. I wanted to include this map just to show the number of different nations that were already here when the Europeans arrived and they all were influencing the politics of the Europeans. They were having relationships with them, with each other. And of course they had a much, much longer history in North America in the actual environment. Like this was their home and the colonists were arriving as strangers and so LaSalle had to understand all of those different relationships, how the politics worked in France, how the politics worked in New France, Canada, how the politics worked among all of these different tribes. <clears throat> so because he started understanding languages pretty well, I'll go back to this slide. This actually shows a picture of him um, constructing Fort Frontenac. He was invited by the governor Frontenac to go on sort of a diplomatic trip to Lake Ontario and meet with a number of Iroquois leaders. And LaSalle was acting as an interpreter and from there was able to build a fort. But because of you know communications and everything else, he had to go back to France again to explain why this fort was built and defend it more or less and um, just get the approval of the king. And while he was there, he met up with um, the finance minister, Colbert. And that was kind of when LaSalle seemed to have been tagged to say, okay, you're interested in the business of the fur trade. You are interested in going further. You clearly have a talent with languages. We're going to ask that you be part of this push to get a warm water port in North America because of the shipping being so complicated out of the St. Lawrence. So I'm actually going to read a passage from my book about that to kind of give a little bit more context of what it was like. <clears throat> Presenting his case to the French court, LaSalle explained that he wanted to explore the Mississippi in order to expand trade into a more fertile climate. 
Not only would the French maintain their control of the St. Lawrence, they'd also have a warm water port, which might help them stave off any British influence on their trade. <coughs> Colbert began his tenure as manager of the colony with the goal of keeping the territory as small as possible. His rationale was that the colonists, out of, the colonists needed to create strong cities before spreading out to the interior of the country, which might have sounded feasible from his perspective in France, but was largely ignored in North America. But the idea of having a warm water port proved irresistible to him. Colbert wanted to exploit Canada's boundless natural resources, but as it was, the St. Lawrence was too arduous a waterway for trade on a large scale. For half the year, the channel was blocked with ice, and even when the route was clear, contrary winds often delayed ships for days from entering the St. Lawrence. The entrance had such a notorious reputation, it came to be known as Cape Torment. Mm -hmm. With the urging of Colbert, King Louis was convinced. He granted La Salle letters of patent permitting the explorer to travel the Mississippi and build whatever forts he deemed necessary for the completion of his mission. Additionally, La Salle would have a monopoly on the fur trade that resulted from whatever territories he discovered on his voyage. There were two stipulations. La Salle would have to fund the mission on his own, and he would have only five years to finish the enterprise, after which he would no longer have a trade monopoly or the right to explore. For much of history, exploration has been the privilege and the burden of wealthy aristocratic men, or of poor men who convinced rich ones to sponsor their voyages. La Salle belonged decidedly to the latter category and struggled to finance his travels. It didn't help that currency in New France flew straight back to Europe almost as soon as it arrived. Any coins that made it across the ocean were usually sent back as remittances by the importers. Colonists were forced to be creative when they wanted to spend locally. Beaver skins, moose hides, and even playing cards with their corners cut off were substituted for official French currency. Since he knew he couldn't expect to raise much money in the colony, La Salle spent several months in France raising money necessary to fund his expedition. During this period, he met an Italian soldier named Henri de Tonti. The two quickly became friends, and La Salle decided that the Italian's experience in military affairs would make him a valuable second in command. The Sicilian was known as Iron Fist for the prosthetic metal hand he wore on his right arm to replace the hand he lost to a grenade while fighting in Sicily. Together, La Salle and Tonti set sail for New France in the late summer of 1678. It was the beginning of their goal to travel to the ends of the Great Mississippi and find out what lands lay beyond the known world. So <clears throat> from that point on, 1678, um, and all the way to 1682, when La Salle actually reached the end of the Mississippi River, he ran into a number of obstacles. So you can kind of see from this map that there were multiple attempts to kind of get this expedition going. On his very first try, he argued that they needed to build an, a, a full ship to kind of carry things, um, carry more furs, carry more men and materials around the Great Lakes, and that was the Griffin. And it was the first vessel of that size ever to sail on the Great Lakes, and it sank on its main voyage uh, because of storms, because the Great Lakes have uh, notoriously bad weather, and there are still plenty of shipwrecks that happen even today. Um, so that having been thwarted, he had to establish a fort and continue kind of going down by canoe as was um, kind of the backup plan more or less. And um, I think it's easy to assume that, you know, like it looks easy on a map like this, but the actual canoeing voyage was extremely strenuous. Um, a lot of the voyagers who have traveled with him wouldn't have known how to swim. It was pretty common that they lived in boats and on the water, but couldn't actually swim. And for portages like this, depending on the amount of weight that they were carrying, a lot of men would develop hernias because they were carrying 200, 300, 400 pound weights as they walked over, you know, mud, marsh, stone, whatever for miles. Um, and then of course you have to consider that there are uh, like pests, like mosquitoes, that the weather is going to be changing, that they don't have regular shelter. So it's not a comfortable voyage. And at the same time, they're having these encounters with different tribes along the way, many of them friendly, but not always, because especially as he goes further down the Mississippi River, that's into new territory that they haven't necessarily met with <coughs> anyone before. But all that said, they do successfully make it down to the end of the Mississippi River, which is when La Salle makes that claim for France of the territory. And kind of as we heard other speakers talk about, this was such an enormous amount of territory that 
when it was bought by the United States in the Louisiana Purchase, it doubled the size of the country. So it was a huge area. Um, and LaSalle kind of had the idea that, you know, this would be the ideal place for a warm water port. And so went back up the Mississippi again, and then went back to France one more time to kind of say, okay, we want to establish a colony down here in the Louisiana area, and we need the men in the ships to do that. So he was granted three ships and over 100 men to come back down to the mouth of the Mississippi River. And when they arrived, <laughs> it took a while, but eventually realized a mistake had been made in the calculation of where exactly they were going, because instead of the Mississippi, they ended up in East Texas. <laughs> so that was um, disastrous for many reasons, not only because they weren't where they wanted to be and so didn't have an easy route to get back up to the Midwest and the Great Lakes area, but also because um, they were dealing with a lot of problems like rattlesnakes killing people and the tribes that were there being more hostile to their presence, so people getting killed in that way. And after three years, the colony had been fairly decimated. There weren't many people left and LaSalle decided, okay, I'm going to try and get back to Mississippi. I have an idea at this point of where it is. He went with a group of men and on that journey, that's, this would be in 1687, um, he ended up being murdered by his men. So it's kind of a tragic ending to his story. And I think because of that, a lot of people kind of ask, who was LaSalle? What was, what was he like? What was his personality? Was he just, you know, this horrible leader that his men hated? Is that why they mutinied against him? Did his men mistrust him? Did he have rivals in the French court and in the colony? And it is definitely true that there were people who did not like him because his forts and land were seized by the government in New France on several occasions. He did have disagreements with the men. But I think one of the challenges of talking about who he was is that anything that we might want to say about his personality today would be filtered through the framework of our 21st century perspective. Mm -hmm. So we can say what we did. We can say that he had a pretty tragic ending and the circumstances were very dire around that. So does that mean he was a terrible leader and a bad person or obsessed with fame and wealth? I'm not sure. I don't know that anyone could say with certainty, but I do think why it's important to remember him is because of what a huge mark he had and because of the relationships that he formed with the different tribes, with his men and with the French government. Um, there was a Jesuit priest in the 1800s and 1900s who studied the history of the French in North America named Jean de Langley. And he wrote about La Salle, a restless urge drove LaSalle from one place to another, a peculiar impulse that made him think that wherever he was, his presence was necessary elsewhere. <laughs> so make of that what you will, another historian who that's his take on who LaSalle was. But honestly, the reason I wanted to um, explore LaSalle and learn more about him, not only was to understand, you know, plaques like these, statues like these, but also because of reenactors like Reed Lewis and the group of men who did the 1976 and 77 LaSalle expedition reenactment. And this was um, largely made up of teenagers who had just graduated from high school and teachers. And, you know, they built the canoes themselves. They uh, made all of their own bowls and spoons and clothes and hats and socks and everything. They created everything. And I wanted to understand why they cared so much about LaSalle and his history and the history of the French in North America in the first place. And I think, you know, for some of them, it was this idea of going on an adventure and trying to live outdoors, live in the wild like people had done before. But for a lot of them, it was that they cared deeply about sharing this history that often gets overlooked in different parts of the country. And so that's why a big part of their expedition was doing presentations in so many school classrooms and universities and public places so that more people would be made aware of that. But 1976, 77, I think it's been long enough already that people have largely forgotten 
that this expedition happened and that we just have to keep going over and over again to try to explain to people that this did happen, this is a part of our history and it does matter. Anyone grab the microphone there and you have a seat? This one? Uh, I think it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. So, I understand why Chicago has all the South Street, but why the street that is, why that street? You know, if that's in a pretty important street. Well, I wish I could answer that, but I don't. I don't actually know. <laughs> it's a short street. If you think about it, because it doesn't. It doesn't end in Grant Park, North Avenue. Well, I'm sorry, Lincoln Park. Um, Lorraine, how did you get interested in the Reed Expedition, Reed Lewis Expedition? Uh, it was kind of luck. More than anything else, I wasn't around when the expedition actually happened, so I did not see any of it uh, before me. Um, I originally heard about it because I was interested in the Griffin, and um, yeah. I met some of the people who were looking for the Griffin, who introduced me to uh, Rich Gross, who then mm -hmm. put me in touch with Reed Lewis. So, and of course, the Griffin was a ship again that LaSalle piloted off of. Would sink off of Washington Island, didn't it? That's what they think at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Have they have they come at close to finding any part of it? There was um, the thought that they had found a spar from it uh, a while, like maybe five or six, maybe longer at this point, years back, and um, there was kind of a legal dispute between the state of Michigan and the people who were looking for it about who would have the rights to actually do the excavation work. So that slowed things down. As far as I know, it's. If that is part of the ship, it's the only thing. It doesn't sound like anything else has been found. Now, uh, I think we heard earlier that LaSalle's ships have been found. Uh, in the, the Bell, LaBelle. And yes. The ones in Texas. Yes, yeah, they've been. Have been found. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Really okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I had no idea about that. So when you, when you approached these guys, Here's this young woman, and you're approaching these grisly voyageurs. How did you get their trust to tell their story? I think showing I was interested was a good first start <laughs> to hear about this. Um, pretty early on in the process, I went on a camping trip with them. And so I think, you know, it wasn't like we were roughing it like the voyageurs, like they had yeah. done or anything at that point, but just spending time together and learning about what it had been like for them, what it meant to them, that slowly opened up to developing more relationships and hearing more of the stories that they ended up sharing. I have two daughters and I would bring them camping when they hit 16, they're like, oh my God, we're not doing this. So I think they were impressed that you could go camping. Right? Yeah, well, that, that part was you know, fairly easy. I like to camp, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, a key component to this, besides Reed Lewis, the French teacher, was um, Ralph Fries. Tell us about Ralph. Yeah, he had really been involved, I think, even before the LaSalle expedition and helping with the Joliet and Marquette expedition, too. He was passionate about building canoes in the way that they had been built before modern tools and everything, so without power tools, without nails and glue and the way that we would think about making things today and it you know turned into really an art form for him and that was a skill that he wanted to pass on and having these expeditions was a way to teach kids who were in high school at the time how to make use this way so how to make them how to take care of them and repair them if they had any holes or anything that happened which you know it did end up happening along the way so and the, the we, um, he built the canoes for the expedition. Right, yeah. As he did for the Marquette Joliet expedition, which was a few years before that Reed Lewis and his brother Ken 
participated in. Yes, yeah, he, he built them and with assistance from the participants so that they could kind of learn how to do it as well because he wasn't going to be there for the entire expedition. So they needed to understand how do these work? How do we take care of them? What do we do if they get damaged? Now, the only cheat Ralph did is use fiberglass, but if you look at it, you can't tell. And that was for a specific reason. They were worried that since the water was that if they used the original material, that it would just decay too rapidly. And those canoes are at the Chicago Maritime Museum in Bridgeport. Yes, sir. Next Oh, that's that's fantastic! Yeah, they should give. Uh, they should call Reed and ask him about mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, can you speak to the changing role, or perhaps unchanging role, of Catholic evangelism uh, in uh, the French uh, program from the period from Marquette and Joliet through La Salle? How important was converting people to the system. So on LaSalle's expedition, it was a lot less important because they were, he, so he traveled, he did travel with um, Catholic priests as well in most of his expeditions, not just the one down the Mississippi. So they were part of that, but the speed at which they had to continue down and try and reach their destination because LaSalle kind of had this deadline of you have this amount of time to do this exploration and then the right is no longer yours exclusively. They just couldn't spend as much time doing that kind of work. I think, you know, the forts that he built would kind of serve that purpose as well because it wasn't just uh, fortifications for the men, but also for Catholics who would be continuing to do the conversions and proselytizing and things like that. The input to the monuments controversy here in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> um, it's. Hmm, I think it is complicated, and monuments are made in a specific time period. They are not necessarily made to represent who those people actually were. They are made to represent symbols that people are attached to at a specific period in time. So something that was built in the 1920s to Columbus, they don't think about Columbus the same way we do. They might not know as much about Columbus as we do today. So I, I think it's very complicated when you're trying to say, well, we need this as part of our history. I don't think monuments are necessarily the best way to preserve history because they preserve a moment in time and a way we think about that person at a specific moment in time. Also, as we have seen from the video that played at the beginning, most people don't notice them or think about them. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Larry, as a follow-up, do you have uh, some ideas about what you think would be more effective ways to uh, handle history? And, and... <laughs> Um, I think we need to teach it better in schools in the first place. Like we have a pretty abysmal history education and I don't think people understand the importance of it. I, I'm speaking from personal experience. I did not like history as a subject uh, when I was in elementary school, middle school, high school. I thought it was boring and I didn't get the point and I was tired of learning about a bunch of dead people who fought wars. <laughs> like, I, I didn't, I didn't care about history until I had a good teacher who made me think about why it is important to care about history. And so for that, that's one step. But I also think, you know, funding in things like public museums that people can visit, um, libraries, like there are so many different ways that we could do it that gets people more engaged. I do think reenactments like this, they, they're not perfect. There's, you know, depends on what people are reenacting, but it does really get people engaged with that particular history. And I think it leaves a lasting impression too. Thank you. 
Lorraine, how, how do you, as a writer, interview people on an expedition reenactment and, okay, these are living people, and then you write your book and you, you come to conclusions and whatnot. Were people happy with your book or were some of the participants not particularly happy with what you had to say? That was honestly the most nerve wracking part of having the book come out was <laughs> having them read it. <laughs> I care a lot more about what they say than any of their viewers. Um, and the response was very good. It was very positive okay. overall, but it was definitely something I was thinking about a lot because they shared vulnerable moments and hard moments. And, you know, there were arguments along the way. So yeah, you're, hoping that you do the best at representing uh, all of making a person a person, not just a character. Did they share their journals with you or? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think that was really what helped make the book possible is, you know, I interviewed all of them at length, but at that <coughs> point it had been almost 40 years since the expedition. So how much do you remember? You know, a lot, but not the conversations or the more, minute details so a number of them had kept journals along the way or letters and shared them all with me which was really generous and very helpful how long did it take you to write the actual writing was only seven or eight months um the research before that was maybe another year and a half to two years on and off and it wasn't a picnic tell us about what happened in hebron indiana Right, yeah. So the expedition itself, I think one of their big challenges is when you're trying to portray the past as it happened 300 years ago in the modern era, there's a lot of things that exist now that just didn't exist then. And because the winter was so cold when they did it, they ended up having to walk almost 500 miles because all of the rivers that they were planning on paddling down were frozen. And at one point, while they were walking along the side of the highway, a truck ran into a number of them and caused some really severe injuries and almost death um, in some of the young men who were participating. So I think it was awful and everyone survived, but it was just kind of a reminder that like there is no going back in time. You can't get away from what we have today. It just isn't possible. Right. I think that's an important point because the, the purpose, the reason they were on the road is they were paddling the, the Kankakee River and then it froze up and then they were dragging their canoes. And then I think Ralph grabbed the canoes and put them in storage. And then they were walking the Kankakee, but they kept on falling in through the ice. So then they switched to the highway. So they're walking on the highway and, you know, it's in the wintertime, gray skies. And, you know, people, this was before our cell phones and texting, people just don't pay attention and just poof, took out a swath of them. Yeah. And um, that was just devastating. Yes, sir. Uh, on one of the plaques I saw, they, there appeared to be an Indian woman and a baby in the back of the canoe. Mm -hmm. were, there, were there people who accompanied them? Yeah, there were Native people who <coughs> traveled with them, um, some as guides, some as, you know, big parties who would go from one place to another. It depended on where they were at different points in the voyage. We have time for one more question. Yes, in the back. <laughs> right. I think we, Reed had a wig that he wore occasionally for fancy <laughs> formal events, but it's not an everyday thing. Um, and I think uh, I'm not an art historian, so I wouldn't know as much about this, but my guess would be that that was a stylistic choice in a painting and a portrait rather than the reality of when he was out canoeing. He probably been shot a lot sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spe especially in Texas. <laughs> yes. Well, again, the book is The Last Voyageurs by Lorraine Busso. It's a fantastic book, and it'll be available for sale here. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you.
And our last speaker is Courtney Joseph. Courtney Pierre Joseph is an expert on the historical figure very much in the news today. His name mentioned on the eights every hour on WBBM 780's traffic report. <laughs> this is, of course, Chicago's first non-native non inhabitant, Jean-Baptiste Point de Sable. If you want to know more about Point de Sable in Chicago history, you might think that the place to begin your studies would be the University of Chicago or the Newberry Library. May know that's not where you've got to begin. You would be wrong. To learn more about Point de Sable, head north to the verdant suburb of Lake Forest and visit the idyllic campus of the same name, Lake Forest College. If you've not been, it's a lovely place. Courtney uh, is an assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Lake Forest College and lectures and writes about Point de Sable. Professor Joseph also has a unique perspective on Point de Sable, who she calls de Saab, as you'll hear, because Courtney is the daughter of Haitian immigrants the heritage of Dussab. I believe her father was supposed to come, but he didn't come and Courtney's mad because <laughs> in my notes, I was gonna say, bonjour, monsieur. <laughs> I also had the good luck of interviewing Courtney for the Windy City Historians podcast on Dussab. And um, she knows everything about Dussab. So, <laughs> Courtney. pressure at all. Not only am I going last, but apparently I know everything. So I don't know how I feel about that. Um, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. I'm going to get my presentation together here. That's a lie. Okay, stop sharing. All right. All right, um, so I don't know where, oh, I'm doing a little bit of this. It's okay, I'll make it work. Um, again, my name is uh, Courtney Pierre-Joseph. I am, I am an assistant professor of history at Af an African-American studies, the former inaugural chair of our African-American studies department on campus. And I'm excited to share some of my research with you, which I have been doing goodness, for about 10 years now on Dusab, and hopefully my first book on him will be out in a couple of years. So today, no, okay. Um, so today's uh, presentation, you need, no? Okay. Um, as I said, I'm a professor, so I do this a lot. Um, a brief overview of what I am going to talk to you about today, a little bit about who Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable was, and then thinking about him within Chicago's landscape. What does it mean that, as many of my present, uh, fellow panelists talked about today, that we see these names around us? How did they get there? What does that mean that they are there? I very much echo um, Lorraine's comments about um, this being one way of doing history, but it is not the only way, nor is it the most important way. Okay, well, that's not gonna work. <laughs> this, yeah, whenever you hit that, it, it doesn't. This one? Yeah, we're not there. no. It's slowly. Okay, I'll be nice to this computer. And so, um, who is Jean Baptiste Point du Sable? I love that this um, bust of him was included in that original video that really did make me sad. It was a very sad original video about the state of uh, history in our country. Um, but I don't think that's an accident. I actually think that's very purposeful. Um, I will kind of be a more forceful argument, I think, around how I believe that history is depleted on purpose to keep people misinformed. And that makes it much easier to pass certain policies to do certain things if people are not aware of the context and the history behind where we live and where we're at. Um, and so, as Chris said, 
I am a very proud daughter of two Haitian immigrants and a history lover from many, many years ago. I fell in love with history. I'm a weirdo, I guess, in that way, um, is a, a like a third or fourth grader. Um, and it was largely due to great teaching that I fell in love, but I also am just like a total dork about history. I watch documentaries by myself at night all the time. Um, and so when I decided to get my, uh, pursue my PhD in history at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and looked for a topic, I realized after finding out my original topic had just been written about that I was going to need to write about something else. And it was suggested to me, why not write about Haiti? Because you tell everybody you're Haitian within the first five minutes of knowing them. I did that today as well. And so um, from there, I started to think about my own upbringing, being raised as a Haitian child in the Chicagoland area. I knew the community very well, and I knew that there had been Haitian people and Haitian culture and impact in Chicago for many, many years. And when I looked on Google and looked for books about it, I found nothing, nothing at all besides one sociological study about Evanston that had been written about Haitian culture and Haitian people in Chicago. And so that took me on what is now, again, been about a 10-year journey with this project that first led me to this individual right here, Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, the first non-native settler of what we now know and stand in right now, Chicago. A man of mixed race born on the indigenous name of that island, which was reclaimed in 1804, IET, after French colonization. He is born, we think, around 1745 to a French father and um, African mother. He, um, based on having um, a French father who we believe was a mariner, was a sailor, had certain privileges that Jim de Couleur in France had, which means that he had access to education, potentially to then learn how to sail and stuff from his father, and just a certain awareness of the world that most people on that island at the time that was known as Saint-Domingue, the colony of the French, which was very brutal. They did not come in peace or friendship when we think about what happens in Saint-Domingue, currently and still known as the most brutal or violent slave colony of that period. So because he did not have that experience, his identity allowed him um, and his privileges allowed him to be able to make the trip from, and you know, um, this is new age map because I had no time. Um, I tell you, I'm writing a book and going to pretend you're this year. It's a lot going on. Um, <laughs> um, and so, Today, if we imagine this back, right, that he makes the trek from where we think he is born, St. Mark, IET, um, through up to New Orleans, and then he makes the trek from New Orleans up the Mississippi that so many people have talked about that's been important to New France to make it to Illinois country at the time. He makes it to Illinois country, we think, around um, the early 1770s and first makes it into the Peoria area, which is, is also part of Illinois today. Um, and this is where I think he makes one of the smartest decisions and also speaks to the friendliness of French folks in um, what is, you know, New France in this part of the region with indigenous people. And so he does something again that I think is brilliant is that he becomes very close to and in fact a family member of Potawatomi folks in the area, in particular through his marriage with an indigenous woman named Kitty Hawa. There's a lot of you know talk, I think um, you hear people colloquially say this, if you want to know the story of how a great man came to be, look at the woman behind him. And I think we can look at the woman next to do Sabo, mm -hmm. to understand how he is able to be so successful business-wise, diplomat-wise, and just survival-wise in this area at a time where it is greatly in, front, in flux. When we think about, quote, the Americans are coming, that, again, signals that things are going to be different in the region, right? And yet they're in this kind of gray area where there's still some um, multi-ethnic, multi-racial diplomacy, trade happening in the region. And so Dusabo and his wife, Kitihawa, make Chicago their home around 1779, 1780. They build a huge fur trade business, 
an incredible home life for them. They had two children. So Chicago's first babies are born Mm -hmm. of this um, couple, Jean-Baptiste II and um, Suzanne which is funny enough, my middle name. Um, No relation, I don't think. Um, But um, it is there that they build this homestead that again, that has things like a bakehouse and livestock and poplar trees are introduced and French and indigenous art, a really culturally rich story that then allows him or or foundation that allows him to traverse the Middle West um, you know, through Canada, through the area, in order to build that fur trade business while Kitihawa can stay and kind of keep the home together as he's doing this. That even happens when he becomes arrested during the um, American uh, independence movement or war. Um, and it is, it's, I think of it as he he's meets um, William de Arntepeist, um, Peister, a, a um, general, a, a British general who says, you know, who side are you on? And basically, this is my crude way of teaching this. He's like, you know, I'm just me. I'm Dusapo, baby. You know, I'm out here doing the big things. Um, and they were like, American? No. He was like, I don't know. Again, I'm doing my own thing. And so he's arrested. Um, and it is indigenous folks. Kitihawa sends Ojibwe warriors and people to call for his release. And this story about this um, is is beautiful and thinking about them coming with their canoes and kind of chanting for his release. And so that is why I um, consider him Potawatomi kin. And I also borrow from um, indigenous scholars who are doing some of this work right now, Starla Thompson being one of them, um, who is also of Potawatomi descent and is doing recovery work on Kitihawa right now. And for many people, um, I think I argue as a lot of the people here, he's probably one of the most known unknown figures in Chicago's history. And I, my book talks about how that's very purposeful. Um, this is a racialized argument, in my opinion, and this is also based on the ways that people spoke against him. Some of Chicago's original founders, you may have heard of the name Kinsey before. Kinsey's mansion is DuSable's house, okay? And no, he did not make it, make improvements on it. Um, as his daughter, Juliet Kinsey writes in Chicago's first history in 1856, Wa Bun, where she begins the process of diminishing DuSable's name in the archive. Well, my father-in-law moved here and there was this other guy who lived here for a while, but like, it wasn't that big of a deal. And that again speaks to um, what John Wentworth picks up, another early Chicago historian who feels as though if DuSable had been as successful he wanted to have been, as he maybe had hoped to have been, that Chicago would have been a black colony, it would have been a black area. And again, this speaks to the ways that I think Lorraine speaks so eloquently to about how projects of the present day have an impact on the ways that histories are written or unwritten. So it takes until the 1930s for there to be a reclamation of Dusab. And I can speak more to the end of his life after he leaved Chicago around 1800 later um, during the Q&A. But um, it is at the 1933 World's Fair that a group of Black women who I, I love this theme today of activists in Chicago people deciding, hey, our history is not being told. We're very proud of our city. (laughs) And our city is not being told, the history is not being told correctly. And so how do we do that ourselves? And so it is Black women, Black teachers in particular, who pick up the mantle of the 1933 World's Fair, where Chicago is being celebrated for its first hundred years. And they see the plans and they're like, where's the DuSable stuff? And they're like, who? Um, And so these women who had come to Chicago as part of the Great Migration, African-American people escaping the Jim Crow South, looking for opportunities in the North. These are educators um, who begin, Annie Oliver is the first one who starts what is called the National DuSable, or at the time, DeSab Memorial Society. Those women lobby at the 1933 World's Fair for an exhibition to be focused on DuSable, and they get it two weeks before the whole thing starts. So these women, you know, put together a pamphlet and like a little log cabin or something to try to like replicate DuSable. And it becomes one of the most popular exhibits at the fair. 
So they catapult um, and, and use that momentum to name um, one of the first structures named in Chicago after DuSable, the DuSable High School, which I think I read is now closed. How? So previously located in the Bronzeville neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, it's just constructed between 1931 and 1934, but officially opens in 1935. Some of my research um, using the lovely, lovely Chicago Defender um, archives, it's uh, Chicago's preeminent black newspaper, one of the biggest black presses of the 20th century across the country and even into the Caribbean. They ran a poll in 1934 to see what would black Chicagoans as the community is growing and growing as you know millions and millions of African Americans are moving into the area um, or hundreds of thousands at this point there's a poll to see should we name it after Dusab and we see that it wins very like prominently that's one of the names that we're going to name it after an abolitionist a white abolitionist and decided instead to name it after who they claim is their black father, the black father of Chicago. And so graduates of this institution by the time it's renamed in 1935 include people like Nat King Cole, Red Fox, Timuel Black, Dinah Washington, and Harold Washington, who will come up later in this presentation. Again, building off that momentum and thinking about the role of black women in particular of keeping DuSable's name at the forefront in Chicago, we have the renaming of the DuSable Museum that happens in 1968, which is actually the year that my dad came to Chicago. In 1961, Margaret Burroughs, um, a educator, artist, writer, activist who had been living in the area decides to open up the first African American History Museum in Chicago in her own home with her husband, um, Charles Burroughs and a few others. They originally named it the Ebony Museum of Negro History and Art. And yet there is also such a thing as Ebony Magazine. And they did not want people to be confused by Ebony Magazine and the Ebony, you know, um, Museum, and so they rename it in 1968 after Jean Baptiste Point du Sap. Um, the building, you know, ends up shifting to the current building that we know in the 1970s, um, and it is um, under the um, Chicago. I'm sorry, what am I near the um, University of Chicago campus area? Um, the, it is now renamed the DuSable Black History Museum and Education Center. So I just wanted to update that, but it's important to think about again, how DuSable's name is included there. There's a, um, a really cool like art um, mosaic that when you first walk into the museum, that is one of the only things that depicts him. That's another conversation, I think. But um, it, I'm laughing, thinking about Ruth, um, that he kind of looks very much like Johnny Appleseed in it. Like, I'm not sure why, but okay. Um, and then um, this is a bus done by Margaret Burroughs, um, also dedicated to Dusab that you can see inside of the museum. One of the things that many folks talked about today is the DuSable Bridge, formerly known as the Michigan Avenue Bridge, that was, um, you know, proposed early on the 20th century to link north and south sides of, of Chicago. Construction begins in 1918. Traffic, you know, it opens up to the public in 1920, totally decorated, as we see, in, by 1928. The location of this bridge is very significant for DuSable's life as well because it is situated in where folks think DuSable's um, homestead site actually was at the time. Um, and it originally, like I said, is the Michigan Avenue Bridge, but in October of 2010, the bridge was renamed after DuSable um, in order again to add more of his name to the landscape and to think about reclaiming his history. Most recently has been the call to rename um, Lakeshore Drive after DuSab. Funny enough, this is not the first call that there was to rename a street after DuSab in the city. Actually first happens in my research, I see some of it in the 1970s, but it's really in 1993 that um, our former alderman, um, Tony Preckwinkle, um, led initiatives to rename it and was completely shut down. 
I was like, no, don't, nobody want that. Um, and then in 2019, it started to gain traction again. Um, but it really sped up after the murder of George Floyd in, in 2020. That these moments that I teach about African American history of um this reckonings that this country has. They have these racial reckonings every few years and they think we've done it and we still ain't done it. But some things come out of those moments and the renaming of Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable Lake Shore Drive is one of those things. So um, there were tons and tons of debates around doing this. Um, Mayor Lightfoot was one of the people who was not at first very interested in this idea. Um, it came into many, many um, votes. It was pushed back. And then eventually the vote happens in um, June of 2021. It passes with a vote of 33 to 15. But I think it's very interesting to think about that breakdown. A majority of non-white residents were in favor of renaming the plan. In contrast, a lot of the votes that were against it were of white folks who lived in the area and around there. So again, thinking about how even some of those original ideas about who gets to be remembered as important to Chicago um, still have entanglements that we see today and have an impact on how people think about what is exactly the history of the city or not. I'm going to leave us here to think about a park that is almost 40 years in the making. Remember I said Harold Washington would come back, he did. Mm -hmm. So in, um, when Harold Washington was mayor in 1987 during the earliest part of his second term, he dedicates 3.1 prime acres of Chicago land on the riverfront to the construction of a park named after Dusab. Because in the speech that he gives, he feels very connected to the fact that as the first black mayor, it is a black man who is important to thinking about, you know, how he's able to get where he is. Mayor Harold Washington passes away of a heart attack and that park never gets built. Um, lots of other parks get built in that time, but not this one. Um, there are many attempts to try to build the park, but they all don't go well. The biggest one is this plan for the Chicago Spire that happened between 2005 and 2010. Um, they went down around the time that I graduated from college. It was an economic downturn. Go me. Um, and um, so did the Dusable Park. It does, you know, that also ends up, that plan goes away when the finances um, go away. As I recall, the, the architecture firm goes bankrupt and it does not go well. Um, and there's been advocacy work, again, this time by a large swath of multiracial multicultural people in Chicago, very DuSable-esque, who come together in what is known as DuSable Park Coalition. And it is people who are African descent. There are Haitian people involved now. You have people in Chicago Park District involved and in saying, hey, how is this park still not built? We're getting parks built every day. And this is, again, something that could be a huge tourist attraction. You see where it's located just over, like right across looking at um, Navy Pier. And um, eventually that advocacy works leads to 2018 when a new developer decides to go on to the project related Midwest. And in 2022, the DuSable Park Design Alliance comes together to win the contract to actually do the park. And so we're hoping the last thing that I heard was hopefully 2024, 2025. I really hope I can see this park in my lifetime. I will say that I was at one of the uh, discussions, one of the town halls, um, to talk about the construction of the park. This was in 2018. And it was so interesting to me, again, to think about the arguments against building the park. Oh, it's going to get in the way of my view. Why does it have to be here? One of my favorites, who's going to be allowed to come into the park? <laughs> What kind of people, what, what sorts of folks are going to be able to come to this very wealthy part of the city? It's going to be a public park. What does that mean? And so, again, the racial arguments and undertones remain as to what Dusabo means and how he is remembered and not remembered in, in Chicago's history. 
Thank you so much for having me today. As always, I got to thank the ancestors. Uh, shout out to Etzer in the back, who is part of the Savile Park Coalition. And again, I am in the throes of finishing my first book um, with the University of Texas Press. Hopefully it will be out in 2024. I'm at the peer review stage, pray for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Courtney, is it true that I heard a rumor? I work in City Hall, I hear lots of rumors. I heard that Brooklyn was gonna name a street for the Sable before yeah. Chicago. Yeah, they were interested in doing that because there is um, a very concentrated population of Haitians in Brooklyn and in New York in general. Another thing about Chicago is nobody thinks about it as a place, a Haitian place, right? Because we don't have a little Haiti in Chicago, um, or as they do in New York and in Miami. Um, but my book and part of my argument is that we're much like more historically rooted diaspora because of the DuSable link. Um, but yeah, they had the mobilization and they had more representation in order to move something forward like this than, than folks in Chicago often have. Yeah, and of course, we don't like to think of ourselves as the second city, but if New York's going to do it, we're going to do, we do it. We got to do it. We got to do it. Yes, we got to do it. Uh, questions for, yes. Why did you stop and leave Chicago? Great question. And so um, largely what we know about DuSable's life is through oral traditions over time. Um, and that is something that I, as a historian, argue is very important, especially for people of color who are often written out of like archival histories. And so um, what we know of DuSable around 1800 is that it's my guess, this is a very strategic man and also known as very handsome in the archive. That's one of the things we do know about him, so I love him. Um, and an affinity for drink, they said, a very good host. What an excellent person. Um, and so I think he's also a really good strategist and is self-aware and aware of where he is, where kind of things are going. And so by 1800, it's becoming less and less fluid in terms of who is living in the area, who is allowed to stay in the area as again, the Americans are coming and Fort Dearborn is coming, right? And so um, the hostility of the Americans in terms of the way of life working with indigenous people, and then again, he is black. And so that whole slavery thing was possible um, for him. And so we think that he moves to Missouri. He sells the homestead. Um, to a man by the name of Jean Lalim, another Frenchman, in 1800. We do have the bill of sale for that. That is how we know so much about um, his home. And makes moves to uh, the Missouri area, St. Charles area. We think that his wife has died at some point. We are not completely sure, but it does not seem that he has many um, reasons to stay in the area anymore. His kids are older. His daughter gets married. Um, and so he makes the move to Missouri, I think, to try to go somewhere where the, his way of life would not be as disturbed as much. However, he ends up in debtor's prison for a while. He is put um, due to some land grabs that a man is trying to make in Peoria with land that DuSable used to own. He says that he should have paid him for it. So he has a kind of tumultuous um, last 18 years of his life. He is buried um, in a, a cemetery that is at the St. Bartholomew Church. However, that cemetery gets moved a few times after his death. And so after an excavation in 2010, um, where they tried to recover his body, the <coughs> site of it was empty. Mm -hmm. And so we are still looking for this album in many ways. Um, I was talking to Courtney before the program and uh, on our Windy City Historians podcast, we did one about the Great Migration, and we were talking about Jim Crow. And in the uh, Jim Crow South, a black man could not, uh, what's the word, could not testify in court against a right. white man. Mm -hmm. But Dusab was able to bring white men to court in Missouri. Yes. So think about that for a minute. I mean, there were more rights in Missouri in that era than, than uh, the 100 years later. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, other questions? Yes, sir. I love the New South origin story for Chicago. I mean, it's a real distinctive thing. I'm a big Chicago, brag about Chicago. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's so unique, you know, the largest city in the world founded by 
large city is western for mm -hmm. a lot of my black men. Mm -hmm. But what I struggle with the Haiti connection and the historical evidence for that, because I know there were black people in Kaskia mm -hmm. that had been brought up mm -hmm. um, and intermarried with the Native Americans and they were spoke French and there certainly were in Montreal <coughs> and Quebec. Um, and so how how can you definitively tie him to and I know there's a high school in, in St. Mark, Haiti, now named for him. Yes, there is. So I know the story's got a lot of legs, but where's the evidence? The evidence is the oral tradition that has survived. I take it very seriously. Um, I don't think that this person, it would have been a random thing for him to say for that long, because it's first said in Juliet Kinsey's book, A Man from San Domingo. And so to me, that speaks to, well, why would they have associated that with him if he didn't say it at some point? Again, we don't have any of his own documents that have survived despite being a literate man, a business owner, all of that, which I also find very suspicious, that would very like have tied him or given him, you know, like the, the evidence that we need to say for sure. Um, so I think that the fact that that is the first thing that's said about him has weight. And then it's the thing that is managed over time. Now, I know that um, Philip Renault brought um, indigenous, or I'm sorry, brought um, Haitian enslaved people to um, Southern Illinois in the late, um, was it the late, it's the early 1700s, I think it's 1716, 1718, to do mining mm -hmm. in Southern part of Illinois. That happened, I think there's like 50 or 60 of them we're not exactly sure what happens to them afterwards, but that's also another clue to me of there is an understanding or a linkage already between IET as it's, you know, the indigenous yeah. and, and the area. The other thing is that then there are examples of Haitian people over time who are doing research to say he belongs to us, like he is one of us. And so one of them is a man um, who was a longtime um, Haitian diplomat. His name is Joseph Jeremy. Joseph Jeremy writes a book in 1950 called Haiti and Chicago, it's on French, where he tries to then rectify and reclaim and look at the name du Sable in St. Mark and try to connect that family to, to du Sable here. And then there are tons of examples in the, um, you know, other times in the 1900s, early 1900s, where Black Chicagoans are like, well, he's from Saint Domingue, let's like make connections with people there. So they're bringing Haitian people to Chicago to speak about their connections to Dusab. Some of them are claiming ancestry or relationship. So um, one of my things, I also for my book did um, about 60 oral history interviews with Haitian people living in Chicago to tell their own story about the community. And so for me, <laughs> it's the same argument, right? Like there's no, no, data, no written data oftentimes about Haitian people living in Chicago, and yet I know they were there, and I know that they're Haitian, and those oral traditions, those stories are the things that fuel um, my research, and so I, I do the same thing with Dusab. Um, I don't think that it's any more likely for him. There are historians who've said, oh, maybe he was an enslaved person from Kentucky. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> how? I mean, like, I mean, just really, how? How does that make sense in terms of he would have had to have been sought after, especially if he's writing his name on papers, you know, and like kind of traversing freely. So I don't think that he would have played with his freedom that much to be that open um, if he was enslaved from Kentucky. There are other folks who consider that he came from Canada, but again, we don't have evidence that proves that. So for me, that means why don't we take the oral tradition seriously and work from there? One, one thing about the Kinseys, uh, as you said, Courtney, um, Jean, Jean Lalene bought the house. Yes. Um, Mr. Kinsey murdered Jean Lalene. Sure did, first murder in Chicago. Yeah, murdered him in cold uh -huh. blood in front of witnesses at Fort Dearborn, and nothing happened to him. Yeah. Also, like you were saying, the Kinseys were elevating themselves over this this person from, uh, from Haiti. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> By the way, just for the record, the Kinseys are jerks. Oh my god! <laughs> so factual. Also, slave owners. Also, um, as I, well, and enslaved yeah. a man in Dusable's home. I'm not a big fan of tearing down monuments and streets, but for Kinsey, no problem. Every day. <laughs> More questions? Yes, sir. Uh, professor, as an educator, uh, I guess first and foremost, how should we, I guess, reintegrate Dusable's story for the for the general public 
and to really help promote that education, <coughs> along with many other figures that have been mentioned today and are not so lesser known or just in general, how, how do you see that as an educator? I really, I mean, I just, I'm doing talks all the time. Um, at this point, anytime I can speak about Giuseppe's name, I am. And so I recently did a talk for some eighth graders at um, a school in Wilmette. And they were so on board with learning. Like they were like, wow, let's get into it. Let me tell you about this. Do you think it was because of this? And very much we're open to talking about like, you know, slavery and, and, and you know, indigenous, um, you know, removal and all of that stuff. And I think we do a disservice in believing, um, again, I think there's politics around this, the kids can't understand hard history and don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, I think we falsely give that impression. And so that is why history is often so dryly taught, so dry. Um, you know, not just in, in elementary school, but in high schools and even in colleges. Um, and I think that finding people who are passionate about it and want to teach is one way to start to make that curriculum come alive. Um, because if, it, if you can make it come alive, then students and other people will want to know about it. Um, but I think that there are and there continues to be, as we see book bans and all sorts of things, as quote, anti-CRT, which again, if your kid is learning CRT as um, like a fifth grader, they're a law student. Like, I'm so upset. <laughs> Our kid is doing great. Um, you know, wow. Um, and so um, all of this rhetoric around what sorts of history we teach speaks to the dangers of telling folks that history is much more fluid, mystery is much more um, representative than what folks want to know. And then you empower people. You know, what do empower people do? They want change. And so um, I think it will require us to think about the ways that education, what do we want when we educate students, right? And do we want them to just be able to spout information or do we want them to feel like engaged and empowered by it? And until we do those things, I think we'll see folks um, trying to keep certain stories out of the, the record. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering if uh, you see an opportunity um, as an educator that, um, you know, interdepartmental, like I see op opportunities, for example, French department, history, or, you know, other kinds of collaborative things, and it could be at any level of the process of education, not just the university level, but I'm just wondering if you see within Lake Forest College, my alma mater, hey. um, go Flames, <laughs> Foresters. <laughs> anyway, I'm just wondering if that's something that you started at Lake Forest College or you're seeing your colleagues elsewhere, those kinds of opportunities. Yeah, interdisciplinary work has been also at the heart of a lot of my research. Like I said, working with um, Indigenous scholars like Starla Thompson, who is a, um, you know, a cultural researcher and does performance and stuff to kind of like, you know, represent history in that way. That's one way that I've been able to learn more, right? So um, there's folks who are thinking about the entrepreneurial side of DuSable, right? And so some of the work that DuSable Park Coalition and um, DuSable Heritage Association has been doing is connecting with students at ITT or um, UIC and also Lake Forest, like different institutions who have different kind of focuses mm -hmm. in thinking about the ways that DuSable's life has a little bit to teach all of us. Um, and then at my institution, more recently, we've had um, a Mellon grant where we've been able to do research on um, race and racism in Chicago. And um, more recently, we had a Humanities 2020 week on campus. And so they brought this huge inflatable that you may have seen. It's called Founders by the Floating Museum. They had that on campus for a week, and that was getting students like, Dr. Jim, what's that big white thing in the middle of the thing? And that allowed me to have like, you know, more conversation. So that's art, you know, as another way of doing this. And so um, I'm so into interdisciplinary collaboration because I think that that's how we, especially being at a school that focused on liberal arts education, a well-rounded education, right? That if you're a doctor, you probably should also know how to talk to people. That's probably good. <laughs> or, you know, if you um, want to go into business that you're aware of, you know, um, 
things like the, the um, 1921 Tulsa race massacre um, that's largely about getting rid of an economic community. And so putting us in conversation with each other, I think, can illuminate other ways of this story being really powerful for us. Uh, yes, sir. In your opinion, is Haiti a failed state? Absolutely not. Okay. Why would Haiti be a failed state when we have people in Jackson, Mississippi who don't have water right now? Yeah, right. right. Why would Haiti be a failed state when people in Flint, Michigan have been asking for water for decades? Why would we be a failed state when people can't vote in this country in the ways that they want to? So it all is about stories that we tell about ourselves and Haiti will always pay for the 1804 moment. This is an international revenge story, in my opinion, because what they did in 1804 in getting rid of chattel slavery and defeating an empire that, a global empire that said that black people are not people. By doing that and declaring a black independent nation, they scared many Europeans and they scared the United States. And so when you think about things, interventions, whether it's um, hate, the fact that Haiti had to pay France billions of dollars in ransoms, you can read about that in the New York Times. The fact that the United States moved the Haitian bank to New York in 1915 during the occupation. See, people want to call Haiti a failed state without knowing who caused them to fail. And where some of that money is still being used to fund things in European countries, Haiti doesn't have that. It doesn't have the opportunity to build a foundation and never has. And so I don't think that it's fair to call Haiti a failed state when it never had the opportunity to do anything independently. Um, it is, again, there are places in the United States that have things, and I just told this story to some folks last night, the United States loves to talk about how it's the freest and richest and cleanest and best place in the world. And then immigrants come here and like my mom was like, when she got here, she thought everything was gonna be clean. And she the streets were gonna be paved with gold. That's what they told them. <laughs> and then she got here and she was like, what's this? This looks like some of the places that I grew up. What makes this so much different? And that is the project of white supremacy every day. And also in uh, the Colombian exposition of 1893, the ambassador to the United States for Haiti was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, who yeah. was sent to do a recolonization mission there. Yeah. He was sent to scout St. Um, Mole um, to be a naval base for the United States hmm. and to encourage the Haitian people to again, try to give back some of their land to someone else. And when Frederick Douglass got there and he talked to Haitian people, he was like, wait a minute, this kind of sounds like what they're doing to us. <laughs> wow. And so Frederick Douglass gets fired from his oh. post after a year because he realizes that what the Americans want to do the, to the Haitian people are the same thing they're doing to African Americans in the Jim Crow South. Wow. Now, now there's a book, all right. <laughs> that's, that's Chapter book. two of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I was just curious if you could speak a little bit. I know that we're probably wrapping up soon, but just about how your interest in, you know, as a young person, the third and fourth grade in history even came about, like you mentioned, having great teachers and everything, like just a couple sentences on that. Yeah, I'm a nerd. Okay, so, um, you know, <laughs> let's see. It was the, I, I do have the memory about this in this. Um, I write about it in the intro to my dissertation, actually. Um, it was the story of the lost colony of Roanoke. So I remember, and it's so funny to me that it was an indigenous, now that I look back on it, it was the story of indigenous resistance that got me excited. <laughs> um, and so I remember the teacher told us that there was an, a, you know, a, a colony that was formed, you know, and that we didn't know what happened to it. And then it was like, okay, time for lunch. And I was like, <laughs> what do you mean it was lost? Like, I was like, totally just like blown, like away, like, what does that mean? So this idea of like historical mystery is really what got me into it. And then we had to do a group project for social studies. And um, I'm also, um, as I said, an immigrant child, but also a Virgo. So, you know, I like things organized. Um, and so I um, told my group, don't worry, I'll do, I'll decide, we're gonna do, you just play your parts. So I wrote a little play about the lost colony of Roanoke and my team, you know, my group mates did their little parts. And I remember, um, to symbolize the lost part, 
I turned off the classroom lights mm -hmm. and the, the kids, you know, who are my group ran out and they, you know, when they closed the door and I turned the lights back on and I dramatically said they were never to be seen again. <laughs> and like, everybody started clapping my teacher. Like it was a standing ovation. And I was like, it's my, like, I'm here. This is what I need to do. Like, like I'm, you know, I'm obsessed. And so um, from there, it was just, you know, um, learning about the states and the capitals was fascinating to me, you know, how capitals got their names. But it was really in the eighth grade when I learned about the civil rights movement that that was the first time I saw history books with people who looked like me and discussion of people who looked like me in school. And so that really took me like, I was like, oh, I'm obsessed again. Like Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., tell me more. And that, you know, turned into going to college, decided to major in history, took an African-American studies class the second semester of my first year about African-American women's history. And I, it changed my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, and so now as an educator, I think that's my goal again, is to empower um, students to see themselves as historical actors, to know that history belongs to them, um, to know that they have something to say and to intervene and that it's not um, what we're often being told about especially marginalized groups, which most of the people in history that, you know, are not the majority of the world, like we just exclude women. That's a lot of people. Um, and so to know that we can see ourselves, we can add things back in um, and, and retell and complicate those stories. And that's been a lovely experience. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> I can't wait for your book to come out. Thank you. <laughs> and we just have some uh, closing uh, comments. Well, thank you all for coming today and recognizing these early French explorers. Who are you? Uh, I, well, I can tell you, and <laughs> who have profoundly impacted our great city of Chicago. And to all of us, they will no longer be hidden in plain sight. Now they will come alive once again. And I think they did come alive. I was walking back from one of our sponsors, Vanille, and walked by LaSalle, and I do think I saw him winking at me. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? You know where he is, North and LaSalle? And then I saw that, and I thought, well, I think we're in good territory. So I want to thank my co-chair, Janet Marutka. Janet and I are the co-chairs today of this event. And our moderator, Chris Lynch, and don't forget to tune into the Windy City Historians podcast. You will learn so much while you're getting dressed, walking down the street, wherever you get your podcast when you listen. He's fantastic. And all of our presenters, oh my gosh, Ruth, Lorraine, and Courtney, and of course, Charles, who came in from Paris, just like the early explorers. So that was great. And really what is truly terrific is the sponsors that we have had through this. Let's give a really nice round of applause to the Sofitel Hotel and Resort right here, right near us at uh, the Chicago Magnificent Mile. Heritage Title Company, big, big, great company in Chicago. Brush Architects, Schwendel Sesto, who's a global realtor at Jameson Sotheby's, to Mary Jo and Kevin Kelly, to the family of Emile A. and Louise C. Moray de Vic. They wanted to honor their ancestors. And to my family too, the Ballou family. Um, also, we have some sustaining chapter um, sponsors who are always with the French Heritage and that's Reed Centrochio, Rayleigh and Associates and Train Incorporated. And also today, we had in-kind donors, Jordan Pinnell, who helped with our video. We couldn't have done it without Jordan. And he had Kate and Park with him helping. Park was our wonderful um, interviewer. And Vanille, who did our breakfast items. And all of the steering committee from the French Heritage Society Chicago, they know how hard we all work together. It was really an accomplishment to get this done through COVID and our great speakers being 
We booked them, we unbooked them. We didn't know what we were doing for a while. <laughs> And then the Alliance Francaise for this wonderful uh, location and ambiance to promote this event. And um, we hope that you will tune into more French Heritage Society projects. We have our um, chairwoman, Lisa, here, who's doing a wonderful job with the French Corridor. She's going to be connecting all of these French sites in the Midwest. And if you get a chance, go down to some of the places like saint jean bièvre Kaskaskia, Cahokia, all these French areas, the Fort du Chart, which is the oldest French uh, establishment in the United States, in the Midwest. These are places you can go for a day trip and really get a sense of this French heritage that really is hidden in plain sight. So if you'd like more information about our group, you can go online to the French Heritage Society uh, Chicago, and you can find out more of our programs. We'll be having a gala, a uh, Mardi Gras gala in February, and check it out for all of our upcoming events. And now let us retire to our French salon for a light lunch, a glass of wine, book selling by our, our authors here, and our flutist, um, William, and conversation about what we've learned about. Bon appetit, and thank you.